use and transfer transportation committee meeting to order our first uh and as you'll see we're the council president here linda kochmar our deputy mayor susan honda the committee members are all here we thank you all for being here tonight and we're and i'm here online and you're on oh there she is okay <laughs> so we all almost have everybody thank you <laughs> let's say so we're going to start with uh, the call to order which i've just done and now we have uh, public comment does anyone have any public comment they'd like to bring before the committee if so we have a great stand with three minutes to talk seeing none we will move right to the next thing which is committee business is there any committee business anybody wants to bring up before we start? Okay, we'll go to item A, which is approval of the minutes of the January 9th, 2023 meeting. Do I have a motion or questions? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the minutes of January 9th, 2023 as is submitted. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Now we'll move on to item B. Redondo Creek Culvert Replacement 85% Status Report and Authorization to Bid. Mr. Mulkey. Uh, thank Welcome. you, um, Chair Doby, um, Council and um, Committee members. Uh, my name is John Mulkey. I am a Senior Civil Engineer for the City of Fairway. I'm going to find my... Back to the Zoom. Oops, I need to turn that on. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, here's the Redondo Creek culvert replacement, 85% status report and authorization to bid. Um, the project location is on just off of Redondo Way and north of State Route 509. Um, behind the apartment buildings. And it's on exist, connects it to an existing right of way where the culvert goes through. Um, the available budget um, with our, we have $1.15 million in swim user fees. Our estimated expenditures are 2.23 million, including design right of way and construction. Um, just to jump onto that quickly, the estimated numbers that we had, Originally in the project, we have a general, we had a general um, review um, of our culvert applications that were the initial um, budgets that we came up with to fund the projects. In this case, in this instance, when we delve deeper into this project, its proximity to the roadway um, required us, the way that you excavate out typically for a um, culvert replacement is you would dig out wide and then build the culvert underneath of it. In this case, we're not able to do that because you can't excavate that width with the roadway. We'd have to shut down Rio Dondo Creek. So instead, because of it's so deep, we're going to have to install soldier pile walls on each side of that and then dig down to that to be able to excavate out. So it's basically doubled the price of of the culvert replacement with based on the situation of the depth of the culvert and the proximity to the roadway. So that's basically, we'll be coming back when we have a, to get more, we expect to get more money from swim user fees to make up for that difference, but we're not gonna come back and request those funds until we actually have a real defined number after bid, but we have available budget in to in other swim views that's unallocated. So the options considered are authorized staff to complete design and advertise Redondo Creek culvert replacement and return to LADC and council for bid award, further reports and authorization, and two, do not authorize staff to proceed with this project and provide direction to staff. And the mayor recommends option one, and I'm available for questions. I have a question. Yes, sir. We've got over a million dollars that we don't have authorized. So you're saying we're going to get it. Where are we going to get that money? Because I can't say move ahead if you can't tell me where we're going to come up with that money. We just it's, did our budget. There's unallocated surface water maintenance funds that we would be able to draw that money from. Is what I so the 1.15 is what's in the budget based on the original capital plan that was on 2019 by our consultant. Um, there's more money in the actual account, um, but the what John was trying to get to initially was we didn't want to come back with a budget 
request as part of this right now until we have actual bids. Um, there's money in the overall 401 CIP. It's just not assigned to this project. So instead of assigning money, finding out we did assign the wrong number when we get the bids and coming back a second time, we're asking to go get the bids and then, you know, the, the council have the chance to approve or not approve the project at that point and allocate money as needed in that account. What, so the money's in the pot somewhere in the budget. Yes. What's not going to get done if we, when we move it over to here? Um, right now it's sitting in unallocated, so it's not tied to a project at this point. Um, so there's a bunch of projects out in the 2026 horizon that are unfunded at this point. Um, this one, based on the fact that it's holding up a road in a failed condition is a higher priority than the ones that are still a couple of years out. There's also county, uh, King County flood levy money that we were talking to the county about supplementing this with. Okay. Thank you. Any other? there a motion? Um, Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the February 21st, 2023 consent agenda for approval. I second the motion. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank great, you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Item C, fiber optic loop project, 85% design and authorization to bid. Mr. Cole. Yes, sir. Um, today evening, uh, chair, council members, and I'm here to present the 85% um, fiber optic loop project, which that's not the right one. Out of it. <clears throat> Viewers at home can see. Okay, this is presentation for 85% uh, design status and authorization to bid for the fiber optic loop project. Um, the map up on the screen, as you've seen before you, and as well as in your packet, shows the um, preferred uh, route of the fiber optic loop. Um, it's called the loop because we already have fiber up pack highway. Um, this will create the redundancy um, along uh, military up Star Lake and 28th from uh, Sound Transit, the new transit center um, by uh, city center. Um, and then also shown on the map is alternate schedules um, in which uh, we'll create further redundancies across 288th and then across to South 312th. Uh, budget, um, this project is funded from uh, sound transit mitigation of 2.6 million. Um, right now, the uh, estimated uh, expenditures on this project is just over 2.9 million. Um, and um, as per over budget, Gotcha, Chair. Um, th that's why we have the options of the other schedules. We'll fund uh, as many schedules as we can afford, but no more than that. Uh, options considered tonight, uh, option number one um, or option number two. And the mayor recommends option number one. Any um, questions? Any questions? Can, yes, can you uh, go back to the map for just a moment? Yeah, of course. Uh, Oh, that's not a good looking screen. Goes into the cave <laughs> there. Is that like the matrix oh. or something? <laughs> screen. Not sure how that looks to folks at home, but uh, the funding, yes. Uh, okay, to, to, to the map before that. Oh, sure. The map, not the. Okay, so the. Um, so, so you say this is a. A, a parallel one to for one, redundancy. So if one line is cut, we'd still have have it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And the reason for the different color coding, sorry if, for any confusion there, we have quite a bit of conduit um, up uh, military right now. I'm currently waiting for um, that conduit to be proofed, what they call proof to make sure that it's still viable. If it is, um, that's also gonna reduce our budget considerably. So. Um, so is, so is like the blue there, is that existing? Exactly, uh, yes. Conduit? 
but we have it on 288th and military. Um, right now, it's inch and a half conduit. It has a chi um, copper um, line in it that um, is our interconnect, talks to our traffic signals, our cameras, and such like that. Um, all the uh, all the popular kids are going to fiber, so apparently so, we need to go so, to fiber. So it would be a matter of just running copper. the fiber through that existing conduit. We're going to pull out the copper and run fiber through okay. the exact same place. And you say that that may reduce the... Uh, the fingers crossed that, that that conduit has not been compromised by other utility work or such in the area. Uh, sometimes we find that that stuff gets crushed. Uh, it's been in the ground for, I think, 20 plus years, so... Mm -hmm. Um, uh, King County um, is uh, proofing that for us right now. King County crew okay. is uh, proofing that for viability so we don't have any surprises down the road. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I guess the question, if, if we don't have the funding for the full amount, what's going to get cut? Um, the portion, um, our IT department has kind of um, uh, given me priorities on this. Obviously, the 288th military Star Lake up to 272nd. Um, over to PAC is the primary route, and then schedules BCD um, will be, um, as well as it's not labeled here, but 288th will be the optional routes. Okay. And we'll, on 312th, we'll kick the, that ball down the road as far as we can get it for the dollars that we have, so. Okay, so so, so go, go to the 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 budget page now yes sir okay so what you're saying is that we would only be going to the actual uh the the 2.6 million yes sir okay yeah. and the others so if everything were done the budget is 2.956 um currently yeah and that's okay. that's assuming worst case scenarios is uh i assumed about 75 percent of that conduit that's out there right now is not viable i have no way of knowing so that's just a number i'm throwing out there so okay but it'll only be 2.6 million and we'll just not do more. the okay yes sir all right thank you of course deputy mayor honda thank you <clears throat> is there is there any possibility of getting more funding from sound transit uh no i don't believe so this was um Basically, um, the mitigation fees were charged for um, in lieu of them running fiber from the north end of town, 272nd, to the transit center. Um, so really, um, we're already trying to stretch a buck um, on how much further we can make it happen with these further redundancies. Um, but from what I understand, the agreement's been signed, signed and closed. Okay, thank you. Council Member Coach, for I, sure. I thank you very much. I'm wondering with fiber optic versus the copper that's already in the ground. I'm assuming the fiber optic is going to handle more traffic. Tremendous amount more. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Think uh, think the old days of dial up to uh, modern yeah, right. computing. So I'm wondering if that's going to be something we would want to advertise to businesses, you know, if they're interested mm -hmm. in coming to some of our, some of these include business areas. Absolutely. And part of the plan also is um, we're running two four inch conduits. Um, the areas that we are running new conduits and that provides opportunities for the city to utilize that spare space in those conduits for other um, resources. Thank you. I want to make sure that we, uh, our, our economic development director includes that in her planning. I see she has her pen. <laughs> okay. okay. So, uh, do I have a motion? Sure. Can I clarify one thing? Yes. Um, so this is the system that runs our cameras and the um, traffic signals and that stuff. It's a private network that just is a circle in the city for operational control. It does not have a connection to the internet um, and the fiber that you may get through Comcast or Verizon or some other commercial provider. Um, so there's not, I mean, just to be very clear, there's not a link to the business community as it currently sits. It's, it's for operations of the city. But if, if technology changes in the future, we, that might be a possibility. We, we, but we as of back, we have a backbone that's ours that who knows. Correct, what be in the future. But as of right now, there's no interconnection to a to a public network. Got it. OK, do I have a motion? Councilmember Walsh. I move that we send option one to the uh, the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much.
And now we're going to move to uh, ordinance E, mobile, mobile food and retail vendor code amendment. I guess that's food trucks, right? I think we're going to do. No, wait. What's that? D, D as in David. Oh, excuse me. I already marked that off as yes. Okay. Washington State Reference Network. <laughs> um, and you might notice I am not Cole Elliott. Uh, Cole is out of the office unexpectedly today. So I'm covering for him real quick. That's why you're walking over there. I thought maybe you were going to take a break already. No, not yet. All right, so the Washington State Resource Network Agreement. Um, this is uh, interlocal agreement between us and the state. Um, so as context, the policy question is, should city council approve the public works director to sign an agreement onto WISERN or Washington State Resource Network? Um, the, and we'll get into what it is in a second, but as background, it's an annual contract that automatically renews the cost of the city's $1,900 per year. It does come out of the operations budget of public works. Um, it's something that we routinely use. Um, and what the network is, is um, if you're, I'm assuming everyone's used Google Maps or GPS on their phone, um, this is basically a very enhanced version of it. So in addition to using the satellites in the sky, that um, your phone uses, it allows the technology that the city uses to use uh, ground-based repeaters as well to have a more accurate location. Um, so we use it specifically for our um, survey poll, a GNSS receiver that's mentioned on there, um, which we use for um, handicap ramps or ADA ramps, as well as going out and laying out projects um, that the city's building and as well we use it for the, um, we map surface water facilities with a drone, a survey capable drone. Um, so it, it increases the accuracy of, of that device to a two centimeter accuracy. Um, so this is a project that it was used on recently. Um, you can see all of the map out that was done with the drone in this case. Um, and this whole road was surveyed in the course of a couple of minutes to centimeter accuracy using this network. Um, we also use it for uh, emergency response. So this one actually occurred on private property, um, but you can see the small landslide that occurred here and it allows us to go in and map it um, without putting staff in harm's way. So this is a picture of what um, I was referencing a second ago. So you can see the satellites in your sky and that is what a phone connects to. In addition, the GPS receiver that you see laying on the ground kind of in the middle of the picture, that's our device um, that we go out. And then all those transmission antennas, they're permanently mounted by um, various cities and um, public agencies throughout King County and the state. Um, so this gives us authority to be on that network and tie into that control. So we've been using this for about six months. Um, as a trial period, the state was kind enough to let us demo it uh, with our drone to see if we could improve the accuracy of it. Um, it sure it did. Um, and it, it is something that um, we're proposing to move ahead with. The cost savings we've seen of being able to do this in-house versus needing to bring in a survey company and have them do the same thing um, is greatly realized within that. Um, and you can see the time savings there. We went from being able to do five ramps in a day uh, or so two doing five ramps in a day versus without this and doing it by hand, we can do about one uh, ADA ramp in a day. Um, and then that road, you can see that was mapped out in 30 minutes. So, and that would have taken, without this, that would have taken two people a full day. So the mayor recommends approval of the proposed agreement. Um, and like I mentioned, the, the reason this is coming to council with such a low dollar amount is it is an interlocal agreement. Um, and by the city's purchasing policy, any contract that goes to another agency does require the council's approval. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilman. So it looks like we're, we're spending $1,900 annually with right. something that can save us how much? Uh, any? A lot. A lot. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, eight hours for two guys, two staff members. Mm -hmm. I mean, right there alone, you're talking a couple thousand bucks in a in one day. So this so. will be able to positively impact the budget. In, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in a significant way now. Yeah, and it already has. We just, we've been on the trial period, so we mm -hmm. haven't had to pay $1,900 yet, but we're at okay. the point we actually have to pay to keep using the system. All right. Is there a motion? Uh, 
I let's see. I moved a, a I move approval of the proposed agreement. Oh no, hold on. I move to forward the proposed agreement to February 21, 2023 agenda for approval. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, now we'll go to uh, item E, right? The ordinance mobile food and retail vendor code of amendment. Good evening, committee chair Dovey, council members Tran and Walsh, council president Kochmar, deputy mayor Honda, and council members, any council members who are on Zoom right now. Uh, this agenda item addresses the proposed mobile food or retail vendors code amendment and specifically follows up on LUTC questions uh, from the January 9th meeting. Uh, as a reminder, the policy question is whether the city council should adopt a new chapter of federal ways zoning code, which regulates mobile food and retail vendors in the city with the purpose of establishing more clear, consistent and flexible mobile vendor review processes and standards. This code amendment arose from challenges that we face in the community development department, regulating food trucks and responding to inquiries from in food truck operators. To put those challenges more bluntly, they were reviewed in, in some detail at the last meeting, uh, but the existing food trucks code is broken, and I reviewed the various challenges with our food trucks code at the last meeting, um, and the solutions are provided in the proposed code amendment. Uh, the code amendment scales the review processes to where and how food trucks operate. It sets food truck specific site requirements that all food trucks must follow, and it defines the mobile vendor use because it cur our code currently lacks a definition. At the January LUTC meeting, Council had comments or questions about the various topics here. Um, so I'm going to address each one of these. I think there were a number of questions at that meeting. So these are the ones that weren't fully answered at that meeting, and I promise we'd come back with answers on. So first, uh, there was some concern about mobile vendors and right-of-ways. So this proposed code amendment changes nothing to the way that right-of-way food trucks are handled. Um, food trucks and right-of-ways require a right-of-way use permit. and to date, uh, at least when I last checked with Public Works last year, there had been no food truck uh, food truck right of way permits issued. Uh, so uh, there's a process for for right of way permits, um, and those would go through the Public Works Department. Uh, so if there's a desire to change that, that would require a separate uh, code amendment. It's also worth noting there have been zero code complaints or violations uh, documented in our permit system related to food trucks and right of ways. Uh, there was also a general concern raised about food trucks and brick and mortar restaurants being regulated differently. Uh, this is a, a pretty common concern that brought up with food trucks. Um, it's really an apples to oranges comparison. Uh, both uses sell food, but that's really where the comparisons stop. Uh, food trucks and brick and mortar have different amenities and needs in order to provide different customer experiences and to serve different target audiences. Food trucks and brick and mortar restaurants are different uses, just as food trucks and grocery stores are different uses. Uh, all of those sell food, uh, but they're they're different uses. And we we subject many uses throughout our zoning code to different requirements and processes. Uh, it's appropriate to do so for the true food truck use as well, even if that means the city's requirements for that use might happen to be less onerous than that of a different use. Uh, whether such as grocery stores or, or brick and mortar restaurants. Um, although it is important to reiterate that food trucks are subject to uh, requirements and inspections by Washington LNI, King County, Public Health, and the South King Fire and Rescue. So uh, those are in addition to the city's requirements. Um, and actually today, many food trucks establish mutually beneficial partnerships and relationships uh, with brick and mortar restaurants. Um, there's examples of breweries that, that maybe don't want to uh, expend the go the extra mile and, and provide food services because that can trigger a whole nother set of of uh, of code requirements. Um, and so they'll sell beer and tasting rooms, but then they'll bring in food trucks to provide the, the food nearby. So um, we see that more and more with with breweries in particular. 
Um, council also asked about the reason for the 180 day threshold in the proposed code amendment, uh, that threshold which triggers a review, a minimum level of review through the through the business license process um, to a food truck permit or even a minimal site plan review process. Uh, so that 180 day threshold is really a cap on what's already happening in practice. Uh, many food trucks already exceed that four hour requirement, that four hour per day per site requirement that's in our code, uh, or possibly they're avoiding federal way uh, because of that very strict requirement. Uh, if, if food trucks do meet that strict daily time limit, the existing temporary use code actually doesn't specify a number of days that a food truck can operate on a site. Uh, it's really a missing time limit uh, that the proposed code update here fixes. Uh, so the code update is less restrictive on the daily time limit. Uh, it actually expands that to 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. can even be expanded further uh, with a request to the director, department director. Um, and uh, and that it's also a reasonable threshold uh, to a food truck permit or uh, that 180 days is a reasonable threshold to a food truck permit or a site plan review process. Um, 180 days can accommodate more seasonal food trucks, so those that might just operate during the warm months, spring and summer, um, without having to go through an onerous uh, permit review process that can take several weeks to months. Um, and it also allows food trucks that do plan to operate more temporarily uh, to establish a, a customer base by operating at the same site or sites within the city of Federal Way. Um, that 180 days is also informed by, by other code uh, timeframes, uh, both in our business registration code and our zoning code. For example, roving mobile vendors uh, in our business registration code, um, which is one specific type of, of mobile, mobile food or retail vendor. Uh, those are only subject to a temporary business license up to 90 non-consecutive days, uh, whereas permanent businesses under a permanent business license have still have to renew that business license every year. So somewhere between 90 days and a year, we need to find a reasonable threshold uh, to be somewhat consistent with our, our business license code. Uh, another comparison uh, that, that informed the 180 days uh, within our temporary use code right now um, for for sites that are under development where a business may just have a temporary trailer or structure um, to operate out of while the, while the site's uh, under redevelopment. Um, that allows such, such structures um, to continue up to six months after that redevelopment has been completed. So that's six months, 180 days. Uh, it's setting such uh, timeframes can be more art than science, uh, but we you look at a lot of different data points and kind of land on what's a reasonable number and that, that 180 days is, is where we landed in the proposal. So uh, lastly, uh, council asked how we'll enforce the 180 day rule. And uh, as with current food truck enforcement and most code enforcement, it's it's complaint based. So, uh, so uh, as noted, there have been zero documented uh, food truck complaints or violations in our permit system, not just for right of ways, but, but anywhere in the city after checking with code enforcement and the public works department on that, that question. So um, that is the update from questions posed at the last LUTC meeting. And the mayor's recommendation is to adopt the proposed ordinance. So. Council, any questions? Uh, I have no questions, but I think that you've done a very good job. I mean, this is an area that I have a professionally have a pretty good grasp of that I've followed closely for the last number of years. And I, I think that this is a is very well thought out and researched and and I would uh, encourage its approval. Okay, do I have a motion to move ahead? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward the proposed ordinance to the first reading on uh, February 21st, 2023. I second the motion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Can I make a comment? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lydia. I didn't see the little hand to go right ahead. No, thank you. Um, it's just a comment, so it's not going to change your vote. <laughs> but um, I think this is great because there are some um, especially ethnic type of foods that either can't afford to start um, brick and mortar type of business. And also it allows for them to introduce their their food to people. And if there's um, a market for it, then they can consider going into a brick and mortar. So 
I really um, support the idea and I think it would be very beneficial for Federal Way. So thank you. Great, thank you, Lydia. Yeah, I, I must make one comment. I called a bunch of the letters that people send in about food trucks. So I was able to change my mind after I talked to a few food truck owners. Thank you. Okay, we get to go to number F, ordinance for the 2022 Comprehensive Plan Amendment, Riviera Property Site Specific Request, Public Works Text Amendment, Non-Motorized Transportation. Is that the one we're on? Uh, yes. And that's, you had a lot of information in our packet, so this ought to be interesting. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Oops, there we go. Oops. <laughs> um, good evening, uh, members of the Transport Land Use Transportation Committee and City Council members. Uh, tonight we are going to um, review the 2022 Comprehensive Plan amendments uh, considered during that cycle. Um, the cycle includes one site-specific non-project request for the Rivera property. Um, this is a request to rezone the, um, the property located at 1600 South 304th Street um, from professional office to community business. Uh, the comprehensive plan amendments also take into consideration public works non-motorized transportation projects, um, including city center improvements, federal way transit center pedestrian connections, um, a boardwalk at the West Fork Hylobos Trail, and other non-motorized facilities around South uh, Federal Way Transit Station. The proposals uh, were issued notice of application and also issued a SEPA determination of non-significance. Um, the comment period expired on April 29th. Um, and the, no appeals were filed. Uh, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on September 15th and recommended to approve the comprehensive plan amendments as proposed. During the public comment period, there were several public comments that came in that you um, received in your packet as an attachment to the staff report. Um, there were several comments regarding the increase in traffic, uh, crime, and other types of illegal activity would be. Um, would be an issue potentially at the site. There were no comments um, proposed or, or no comments were received on the proposed um, public works um, pedestrian um, amendments. So we'll take a look here at the Rivera project site. So again, this is a parcel on South 304th Street at the intersection of 16th Avenue South. Uh, the site is approximately 1.26 acres. Um, and currently is zoned professional office. Um, the request is to change that zoning to uh, community business, um, which we can see uh, surrounds this parcel to the south and also um, over into the Pacific Highway area. Uh, the property is surrounded by um, a mix of different uses, including single family to the north, uh, multifamily to the west, uh, Federal Way High School to the south and other uh, mixed retail uses, including vehicle repair, vehicle service uh, station and repair. Um, the BC zone affords uh, additional flexibility um, as opposed to uh, basically an office only type zoning. Um, the Public Works Comprehensive Plan non-project text amendments, um, as we can see here, uh, would be to extend the BPA trail from 11th Place to 13th Avenue South along the north side of 324th Street to 23rd Avenue South. Um, the uh, Federal Way Transit Center pedestrian connection um, would preserve that, uh, that sidewalk and access between large blocks within the city center. Uh, the North Fork West Hylobos Trail 
um, would be constructed um, along that along that area there. There's no exact location for it, um, but that would be um, that would be looked at during project design. And other non-motorized facilities around the South Federal Waste Transit Station include South 359th to SR99, construct sidewalk and bike lanes, uh, 6th Avenue, um, again, sidewalk, bike lanes on both sides of the street, um, South 59th to SR161, construct sidewalk and uh, side staircase and ADA accessible ramp, um, also I-5 crossings um, and other non uh, motorized pedestrian uh, connections, um, 20th Avenue South, South 360th, um, construct sidewalk and bike lanes on both sides of the street, um, and also Milton Road South, uh, construct sidewalks and bike lanes on both sides of the street. Uh, that is the conclusion of what those amendments are, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Council President, Coach Mar. Oh, thank you. I'm just wondering uh, what is being proposed for that site to be built, or what are, what are some of the options that could be built, or, or is there a proposal? There is currently no proposal uh, for the Rivera site, I'm mm -hmm. assuming. Um, right. okay. The uh, property owner, uh, Mr. Rivera, had applied for office land use permits back in uh, 2007, um, which was not successful in um, in being funded uh, just due to office not being um, as as necessary. Um, so the professional office category um, is pretty limited. Um, the community business also is um, much more flexible and would permit uh, a wider range of uses. I can list them off if you'd like. Uh, um, could you list them, please? Natalie, if you'd like me to, I'm looking at them. Um, I got it. Yeah. I think you can. Uh, so professional office, um, obviously office use is permitted. Schools, daycare facilities, um, and commercial daycare facilities, um, government facilities, uh, public parks, public transit shelter, public utility, uh, personal wireless facilities, churches, and urban agriculture would be allowed in the PO. Uh, the community business um, allows office retail, uh, manufacturing and production limited, breweries, distilleries, and wineries, um, entertainment generally, which that would include restaurants and things like that, um, vehicle and equipment sales, service repair, rental, and self-service storage facilities, uh, schools and uh, commercial daycare facilities, and animal, kennel, animal kennel, kennels are permitted in that zone, uh, multifamily dwelling units, hotels, and motels. Hospital facilities, convalescent centers and nursing homes, uh, senior citizens or special needs housing, um, group homes, permanent supportive housing and transitional housing, emergency housing and shelter, uh, government facility, public parks, public transit shelter, uh, public utility, personal service wireless, churches and urban agriculture for the BC zone. Thank you. So some of those things you read off are really not a hot button for development in our city. Transitional housing, uh, apartments, multifamily. Shelters. What's that? Shelter. Shelters. So uh, can we, well, I'm not ready to support that if we're gonna put that in our, add that change, make that change. I have a question. Go ahead. So uh, Federal Way High School is just, right across the street. Do we allow transitional housing and shelters next, so close to a school or? No. No? What about breweries and what else? You said something with- uh, The breweries, distilleries and wineries. Um, Are those, can that be right next to a school? I am not sure. There's nothing in our code, but there could be some state licensing where it's not allowed, okay. but I, I do not know. And then they could build multifamily there also. They could, correct. And it could be five stories? Um, well, it's not a very big site. So, right. you know, you're gonna have to, you're, you're limited to providing, um, you know, what needs to be on site for parking, landscaping, um, 
for multifamily development or commercial development, um, it's required to be um, within 100 feet of a single family zone. Uh, the height limitation is 30 feet. So that would be 30 feet max from within 100 feet of the north property line where there are the single family uh, neighborhood is located. Um, there's the attached dwelling units to the east, um, some fourplexes. Um, so that would not have a specific height limitation and setback to multifamily to multifamily. Um, but you would need to design the site and have all the accommodations for parking, landscaping, open space, and things of that nature, which would um, dictate how many, you know, how, how developed it would become. And Deputy Mayor, if I could just add a, a brief thing there. Um, there is, it's true that emergency housing and shelter would not be allowed that close to a school, but permanent supportive housing and transitional housing are not required to be um, distanced from schools. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Walsh. Yeah, with the permanent supportive housing and transitional housing, you said, they're not... Uh, we've all recently done some things in our code that dictates distance between different things on that. How would that impact this site? So there is a requirement that a any um, permanent supportive housing and transitional housing unit be distanced at least one and a third miles from another property that has such a facility on it. Um, I don't know as to this specific location, whether there are existing facilities around it that would prevent this site being um, being used for that specific use. Um, that's something we probably need to look into unless um, Natalie or Keith, you know, the answer to that off the top of your head. I do not know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I don't believe there is any within that area. I guess another way of saying that is if there is indeed a permitted permanent supportive housing or transitional housing facility um, with more than two units within one and a third miles of this location, they could not cite the use of this location. Yeah. You want to yeah. follow up? Yeah, with, 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 the, the, with the veterans, the with the veterans, uh, um, <laughs> no, my mind just slipped, uh, just down the street. Housing, that, veterans uh, housing. Yeah. Uh, What's it called? Uh, 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 William Wood. Yeah, yeah, William Wood Housing. Is that, does that qualify as permanent supportive housing? Because that would be less than a mile and a third. Keith, do you know the answer to that? Um, I'll look to Brian. I think the answer is it is. It is. Yeah, it is. I, I don't know the, the linear distance between that and this site, but it is. Um, is it a supportive housing though? I don't think it is. That must have been Lydia. Lydia. It is. It's no. Lydia. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're you're not on the screen and we didn't see your hand. So you <laughs> <laughs> go right ahead, Lydia. No, I was saying I don't think um the veterans housing is per supportive permanent housing. It's just permanent housing. So does that make a difference then? So the, the definition would be zero to 30% AMI. And I don't, I, I am assuming it probably falls in that category council member, but I don't know that detail. I think it does because um, King County housing is partner, but supportive permanent housing is different from permanent housing though. So that's, that's what I'm saying. That's my point. So I have a, I have a question that when it comes up the the, the property we're just talking about, the veterans housing, I believe that's less, that's about 1.3 acres, isn't it? Does anybody know that? I know, but the reason I, I think that property is not much over an acre and you can see what was put there in the way of multifamily housing. It, it wouldn't have that hundred foot setback restriction though, like what this, I mean, I don't know. But with I this just... one, a hundred foot setback for more than thirty feet, for thirty uh, uh, thirty feet high. I mean, that pretty much limits what could be. It, it, what what I'm saying is, I don't think it. I think like the William Wood housing would be practical on no. that site. It might not be practical, but if the sizing is right, mm -hmm. I mean, I sold that property too. I used to own that property, 
Okay. And it used to be a one story building. And now you see what it is. Yeah. And it's less than 1.3 acres. I mean, about the same. I, my other question is, because this came up the other day, this owner of this property, how long have they owned the property? Do you know? I do not know, but Mr. Rivera I mean, is here. I mean, if they own the property knowing what it was, I guess I'm just trying to understand. Sure, yeah. yeah. The, um, I'm, so, I'm, so originally um, he did apply for and received land use approval for an office, but was not able to construct that due to the you know, lack of, of really that funding that that yeah that niche kind of office only so um you know this property is located within um the expressed area within the comprehensive plan where we want to have you know the bc type zoning so it's supported um pretty thoroughly within um where that corridor is is discussed within the the comprehensive plan oh. yeah you know, I, I'd say that, that a couple of things. One is it'd be good to answer kind of, kind of this discussion, the permanent supportive housing type thing. I mean, I, I think we need to have some some clarification on that. And then also, is there any other type of zoning that would give him, Mr. Rivera, more flexibility, yet still preclude some of the concerns that, that, that we have? Or is it is it either or? Well, the comprehensive plan encourages the BC zone from in this stretch. So it makes the most sense if you want to diversify what uses could be on that property to zone it BC. Um, the neighborhood business zone is also similar, um, but it's not really called out in the comprehensive plan for it to be located along this stretch um, of the city. Along those lines, could this land be zoned for? Uh housing sink make the lot smaller and have uh, housing built there instead of uh, potentially multifamily so sing, you're talking single family detached oh yeah 3600 feet next door at 9600 behind it i mean couldn't it be more contiguous with what's already around there <laughs> i guess that that's a matter of, a, of opinion, I suppose. Um, so to, yeah, I get it. It's an opinion. I mean, I'm just asking the question. Mm -hmm. Are we bound? I mean, the, the person's asked for BC, I'm assuming, correct? Correct. Um, but it doesn't, it could be something else to make it. A, it could be, but it wouldn't be as consistent with what the comprehensive plan says. Or, uh, for or it could stay where it is. Or it can. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. So if this were to pass and someone wanted to build multifamily there, could we limit multifamily to duplexes or triplexes on that property? Um, not really, no. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering if we could ask Mr. Rivera to come to the podium. He's sitting in the audience. I'd be interested to hear what he has to say. And I'm sure it's been difficult because if you've had it since 2007 and you want to sell the property and it hasn't happened because of office. Yeah, I've had it actually since 2003. Okay. I had to, how do you say that? Where you combine, I had to buy like three separate parcels to combine them. And honestly, some of the things you're talking about, I'm not even aware of that type of thing. I just wanted something different from, I was so limited with uh, just the office building. And obviously, my, I don't know if you guys remember last time I spoke up here, my bank went out, they, they went under when that 2007, 2008 thing happened. And nobody else wanted to finance it because there's so much vacancy in federal way. So I just wanted to expand a little bit and I talked to the folks next door and this is what they had recommended because I was just open to basically anything that would allow me to have a combination of whether it be business, retail with some housing because on, that, on this BC plan, it allows for commercial, and then you can have some units above. But going back to a lot of the things on that list, this place is 1.26 acres. And with the parking ratios and stuff, most of that stuff could never even be built there because of the height limitations and the parking such. 
a, a structure that's about 10,000 square feet can be on there, given all the restrictions that the city has. But I'm here to answer any yeah, other questions. Yeah, I'm, right behind you are some duplexes, right? There are duplexes behind I you? think to the left, mm -hmm. to the left of it, there are some, uh -huh. there are apartment buildings of some type. I think it's mm -hmm. a fourplex, I think. A but fourplex. I don't know. I, they look like apartments to me. I, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what they are. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the site because my the, the dental office is right there on one side. My wife worked there for 20 years. Yeah, I've talked and to so, him often over the years. I don't know if he's and, still around. It's been about a year yeah. or two. And uh, so I know that with some of the the uh, the letters that came in, they were concerned that if there was multifamily there, it could increase the crime and everything. But just speaking from, from my own observations there, most of the crime is at night when there isn't anybody around. And if there were multifamily there, it would probably, it mean there'd be somebody around who would probably decrease the crime right. rather than increase the crime. Right now I'm dealing with, and it happens more in the summer, I'm more than anything every month or something, I have to go out there with a truck or hire somebody even in one case because they're using it as a dumping zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I have to pick up drug paraphernalia and such that's yeah. being left because it's just an open space. But I'd be okay with all the, those, I wish there was a way, the things you guys are talking about, whatever that veterans facility is, I don't even know what it is, but if that could just be crossed off the list, I mean, it's not even something that I, I don't know if there's a, yeah, I don't think so either. I don't, I don't know if there's a ways can, to get around we, that or not. Can we do, uh, what are they, concomitant agreements where you, what somebody could actually do? It is at least an option to enter into a development agreement, which is kind of the modern day nomenclature for concomitant agreement. Um, that that is a possibility. Yes. I have a question, real quick though. Whatever I was going, I mean, I because I went through this process once, which was it took a couple of years to get that permit that I did have that, and the building was never built. Even if something's proposed, from what I saw that first time around everything has to be approved step by step. So if it's something that didn't work, it wouldn't be approved. Am I not correct on that? Even if it's within the zoning, like the building I did propose and had the plans for and got approved every step of the way, I don't know how many checks and uh, it just took a long time. And there was a lot of different approvals from every different department within the city, it seemed like. Yeah, and just, just to kind of generally answer that question, if you were to approve this zone and comprehensive plan change, that's step one of many, many steps that it would take before permitting an actual development on the site. There is many other layers of, rev of review, environmental review, potentially public, um, public comment and outreach, depending on exactly what's proposed, traffic studies, you know, all of that sort of stuff is, is stuff that would still need to be done prior to ever actually um, permitting something specific on the property and getting it approved. So, so my question is, on this specific request, does it have to be done tonight to move forward, or can we as a, as a committee talk about it, and does it move it back if it's another month before we actually make a change, or is it critical that it has to be done right now? I know, understand as a, a landowner, you know, time is of the essence, and well, you want to move ahead as fast as you can, but... Honestly, uh, I've had it. I mean, this has been for years, and years, so it's not. I, I, there's nothing pressing. I promise. So the main limitation on on what the um, what the city generally and the council obviously can do with these types of comprehensive plan changes is we review them on a yearly basis, and all of the comprehensive plan amendments that are proposed that are considered on a yearly basis must be considered at the same time. So what that means with respect to this is if you wanted to take a bit more time to consider Mr. Rivera's application, uh, that's fine. That would also apply to any other comprehensive plan um, proposals which are currently in front of you, including the Public Works Text Amendment. If, if, for instance, you wanted to just consider one of those and only consider one of those this year, then the other one would get bumped to next year. So, um, is there a is there expediency on the other ones or not? I mean, is there with with the rest of the package? 
I, I've discussed that with Public Works, and there isn't a month isn't going to make a difference on the Public Works package. Okay, so I can only speak for myself. Um, I don't want to have our council be considered as something that is anti-development. Uh, you know, we're stuck in our ways. We don't want to do things. But right now we have so many things happening right now in front of us with the Stevenson Motel. We've, we've been having a lot of things happen with uh, the treatment centers at the Red Lion and the other hotel that's happened. We've had customers or citizens come to us about multifamily housing and things along those lines. This is, if we were gonna vote on it today, I couldn't vote on it. Maybe my other two people could to move it forward. But if we talk about it and really see what we're going to be actually getting there, then it makes it to me a lot more sense. If we're not time sensitive, it has to be done tonight. And it could be done in the next 30 days and we actually look at it. Now, I know staff spent a tremendous amount of time and a lot of effort and, and, our, and Mr. Rivera has also, but um, I don't know. It just doesn't seem feel to me as the thing that I would want or the citizens would want to have done today based on all the input we get all the time here. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me as though it would be wise to to put it off a month. But I think that if we were to do that, we need to have some specific questions for staff to answer so that we're not in the same spot we are right now, a month from now. And I, I think we need to to figure out what those specific questions are well i think we many of us would have questions based on the list of what bc is versus office what it is today and i don't know if we, there's could be some uh comments on those or restrictions or along the bc but if, if i might suggest one thing that we could definitely get an answer on it's the nature of the william wood development and whether um, permanent supportive housing and transitional housing would be allowed based on that development and its proximity that would be a key one to know the answer um thank you so are you suggesting then that um this whole everything be come back to this committee in a month and then either make a decision at yeah. that point or not yeah. make a decision. Vote it up or down. Yeah. In a month. It, in a month. Okay. It wouldn't go any further than that. And the property owner would have a know what's what they have and we'd vote it up or down. And yeah. it is what okay. we voted it, how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that'd be good. I, I mean, I, I want him to be successful with that. I mean, well, he's time. obviously a very patient man. I mean, but almost 20 <laughs> years uh, with 20 it. Years, yeah. And but but I want him to be successful, but I want to make sure that it, it fits with the with what's best for the city as well. Chair. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Well, I see this a little bit different. Um, to me, if the applicant uh, make the application to rezone uh, you know, his land, and if that is within our comprehensive plan, um, I mean, I don't see the reason why we should delay our decision. I think some of us um, are worried or fixated on the transitional housing, and we, you know, that's why uh, the two gentlemen on my left, so worry about um, making the decision tonight. But uh, to me, if we are going to call the vote today, um, I will go ahead and approve it. Uh, but I can see that uh, my partners here are out, uh, voted me. So, uh, well, and I might be the only one. So, if if you want to make a motion, you're more I'm more than willing to take it. See, or you want to wait thirty days. I, I'd like to move that, that we we put this off 30 days and and uh, and consider it in the uh, in the March meeting. So if we are going to de delay this, can we make sure that we ask the questions so that staff can prepare uh, for the next uh, land use meeting? 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Also, I think it might be wise. I mean, with the other, uh, with the other part of the uh, the comp plan amendment, uh, that make sure that we don't have any questions about any other part of it that should be presented to staff uh, in the next month. As far as I'm concerned, there are no other questions other than just the Rivera property one. But I, uh, but no. I don't want to get to next month and all of a sudden other questions on on other parts of it pop up that that uh, we're not prepared for. Uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. So um, in one of the letters that we got or staff got, the folks said that they bought their home based on that your property was, you know, based on a professional office and not BC. And so can any property in the city of Federal Way, can the owner request that the use, that the, that it be changed from one to another yes so any property yes thank you yes no not mine yeah so so anyway so i i've made a motion to the table for a month Is there a second 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 all in favor aye aye, aye. thank you Thank you. Item G. Item G is iconic sign code amendment. We're going to tag team you tonight. <laughs> a little bit of extra firepower to get this through. Hi, good evening, Chair Doby and LUTC committee, uh, Council President Coachmar, Deputy Mayor Honda, and any of the council members that might be on Zoom tonight. Um, it's my first time presenting to you, so I hope you'll forgive me. I have a few notes to make sure that I don't mess up. Um, when the committee considers this ordinance, I thought I'd offer a brief economic development perspective and share a few thoughts about the iconic sign ordinance as it relates to the practice of economic development. When we look at economic development, there are two main practice areas. There's business retention and expansion and business attraction. So as an economic development practitioner, there are many factors to consider and present when we help attract, retain, and grow businesses in federal way. And conversely, those same businesses we approach are researching the tangibles and intangibles of the business climate in federal way. So to that end, there are several intangible elements that the iconic sign ordinance highlights for the city. First, it honors the historical significance of the iconic businesses. And second, it demonstrates that federal way embraces the same can-do spirit, innovation, and entrepreneurial spirit of iconic businesses, while highlighting the fact that many have historically helped form the social and business fabric of communities over the decades. So on the point of historical significance, the type of businesses most typically that fall under the iconic sign ordinance could be said to be family owned or for multiple generations, be businesses that have com competently weathered the ups and downs of the economy, as well as the changing trends and tastes, and even a global pandemic, which affected small businesses the most greatly. Regarding innovation, can-do attitude, and the social fabric of the community, economic development and city growth are founded and grounded on what types of businesses are here and come here and what environment they create. Federway has a history of can-do attitude and innovation and can continue to be a lighthouse for this type of generationally owned, strongly rooted company, which in turn begets the attraction of more similar companies in future by allowing these businesses with historical roots and unique Pacific Northwest personalities to be found in federal way. Lastly, mostly most iconic businesses grew and have become iconic in part due to uh, how they have invested and reinvested in social activities, events, and the well-being of communities that they are in. 
from participating in food drives to school programs to sponsoring sports teams, these types of businesses have endeared themselves to the community by helping form the fabric that has built cities in the Pacific Northwest over the past decades and hopefully will continue to do so. Thanks for your time. Um, good evening, Keith Niven, Community Development Director. So um, the policy question in front of the City Council is, should the City Council amend chapters 1905 and 19140 of the Federal Way Revised Code to create a provision for iconic signs within the city center portion of Federal Way? So we talked a little bit, uh, going dating back to December, about iconic signs. Um, you know, generally you uh, know them when you see them. There are certain signs that are uh, native to the Northwest um, that many people can relate to. And, and part of the provision for allowing iconic signs, as Tanya said, is to one kind of showcase those businesses that have been in our area for a significant amount of time and giving them the opportunity to showcase their business through a separate uh, provision in our sign code. So there are a number of criteria in the draft um, code, uh, and I'm not going to go through those with you tonight. Um, we can talk about them more if you'd like. Um, but needless to say, there are a number of criteria that these type of signs need to meet to be able to be permitted within the city. Um, so we talked about this both at uh, land use and transportation in December, and then we talked about it again at full council uh, in January. And the things that I've heard um, as part of those conversations with the council, the first one is right now the proposed ordinance uh, would make it a department director decision. Uh, an, an option would be to allow it to go to the city's hearing examiner. Um, staff's perspective on this is all this would do would be to increase the permitting time, which seems to be a disincentive for somebody actually going through this process. B, uh, limit iconic signs to building mounted, um, not allowing for freestanding signs. Uh, many of the signs that you saw in the previous slide were freestanding signs. Uh, if we limited them to just building mounted signs, although I think that would be a step in the right direction, I think it would also limit some of the um, iconic signs that we would otherwise see. Uh, the third item was maybe shrink the geography of the city, um, not the whole city center, but maybe just the downtown area as a starting space. Um, I think that's clearly an option that we could follow. Um, the problem is we haven't defined downtown yet. That code amendment is, is on the tracks for later this year. Um, the fourth item would be increase the number of years from 20 to 50. Right now, what we had drafted said the business needs to be in existence for at least 20 years. And some people might think that 20 years is not long enough to establish a business as an iconic business. Um, and maybe that that duration could be expanded to 50 years and staff would be supportive of that. That's a completely discretionary measure uh, for the city to pick uh, the number of years. And then the last item is, you know, provide some incentives for this to actually happen. If, if this is something that we feel is going to add some character to our downtown, to our city center area, um, then provide some incentives for these type of signs to actually happen. And a lot of those can be, don't need to necessarily be incorporated into the ordinance. They could be uh, processing incentives that uh, could happen through the permitting process within community development. So um, Planning Commission held a public hearing on the 2nd of November, uh, 2022. Uh, city received no comments from the public. Um, the, recommended, uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the proposed code amendment. At uh, Land Use and Transportation um, on the 5th, uh, they voted, uh, you guys voted two to one to send the proposed code amendment to council for first reading. And the mayor's recommendation is to approve the proposed code amendment. So with that, uh, any questions for me or Tanya? Did she leave? Oh, there you are. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask a question. Please. Since this has come up, I've seen iconic signs at Cheney Stadium the other day, um, which was never there before. And to me, let me just make the statement, the word iconic 
maybe we're using the wrong word. To me, it's more um, very unique sign. It's not so much if somebody came like if somebody came like the Dick sign we're looking at, or the one I saw at Cheney Stadium today, or I, even the elephant car wash I've seen driving. Now that you've brought this forward, you see a bunch of these things. If we're going to do this and we want this in our city, I'm not sure we'd want to go to 50 years. I would almost think you'd ratchet it the other way. So people get creative with signs. Of course, I was in the sign wars here back in the day. And um, so I'm, anyway, iconic, I think is the wrong word. It's more it's art deco, it's more uh, uh, eclectic something along those lines that make it something that people really notice and that we're known for it instead of one iconic sign with a business that's been here 50 years in in the state of Washington or maybe it's McDonald's they've been here more than 50 years but <coughs> I and I think if we're going to do it we should incent people to do that type of thing in our downtown but those are my comments yeah, yeah I, I'm I'm somewhat in generally in agreement with that. I mean, th those iconic signs uh, weren't always iconic, and uh, however they were were creative, they were unique, and they they were were basically place markers. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure how you determine. You know, I, in in the ideal world, I would say, hey, let's have it so that. It, we will allow potential iconic signs that will potentially someday be iconic. But how do you how do you figure that? I mean, that's not a realistic thing. But I mean, it's. But if there was some way, I'd say that that's the way that we should do it. Like I say, those signs were not always iconic, but they became iconic. And but if 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 if, if in your brilliance you have any ideas of how to do that, I mean, I'd be entertained considering that. But I think it's probably an impossibility but but i overall i i think i'm i'm in favor of the of the ordinance i and and just that said i mean you know the the other jack was saying hey he was in the sign wars here and, and <laughs> i mean i i would not like to see federal way go back to the way it was 30 years ago 35 35 years ago i mean it was it was a, a, a blight uh but i i do tend to think that we perhaps in our zeal to fix that we may have gone a little bit too far uh however i certainly would not want to see that come back Deputy Mayor Hi. Honda. thank you <clears throat> thank you so i have some concerns that that i had in december i went and sat and looked at this sign um up in the the kent dix location and it's on a pole. It's pretty. It's cute. I mean, it, there's nothing ugly about it. It's it is pretty cute. The the top of it moves around, which I don't believe our sign code allows anything like that at this point. But my concern is that that first of all, we're I think we're going going to be opening something that we might not want to <clears throat> open because we might get more than we think we're going to get. We, along requests um but that whole you know the commons is being redeveloped and our sign code currently allows for only so many signs on a piece of property and i know that we've allowed i believe we've allowed the commons to have more than than what the sign code allows or we did something with that years ago so i would suggest that uh, we just redo our sign code because we know that the sign code has to be um, updated anyway. And during that process, we, we talk about this. And then we find out what other businesses are coming into the commons and what they want to do with their signs too. Because it seems to me that the, the sign, even on the, the Dick's restaurant in Kent, is larger than what we might allow. So then we're, we would be allowing, and I know that they put in a, a, a request, a permit request already because the mayor sent it to us. 
So we would be allowing two signs for one business that we currently wouldn't allow. And yes, I'm glad that they're coming here. They'll bring people here to Federal Way, but I'm not sure that this is the right thing to do at this time, not knowing what else is going in, in on the Commons property and how the downtown um, will look in a couple of years. I just think we need to redo our entire sign code like we've been talking about doing for years and years and years and have this as part of that. Um, I, I received a text message saying that people can't hear us. I'm wondering if um, Thomas is in the booth, uh, can check on that. The land use committee meeting isn't being. I was made aware of that and brought that to IT's attention okay. and they are aware the sounds going on. There is a, a, a problem with that. It may not be able to be corrected tonight, but will okay. be corrected uh, for the broadcast or the, the recording that will be on YouTube. Thank you. Okay. Um, my uh, concern is that I don't want any um, wonderful business not to come to our community because of, they can't have their iconic sign, whatever you want to call it. I did drive around and look at our signs, and there are some base signs that, you know, are not short, but they're taller. And they're kind of like a, I don't know how to call them, a rectangular base kind of a sign, which I thought would be appropriate for Dix, but I, I think we should look at the sign code also so that we don't preclude anybody from coming. I I um I came in right after the sign wars. <laughs> and I I but the sign wars weren't just about the signs, they were also about the overhead lines and the way our downtown looked and was flooding and a whole lot of other things were going on at the same time. So but I do think that we should look at this. I mean, if Tanya White Stag wanted to come here and didn't want to come because we wouldn't allow their iconic sign. I'd have a lot of issues with that. So um, they're a wonderful clothing manufacturer. Are employee. they still in business? I thought Apparently, they closed. Apparently, <laughs> I think they are. Yeah, actually, Pendleton. Yeah, I've been down to. Yeah, they are. Um, he's he's also been in Oregon. So um, yeah, I'd like to review. I but you know, going over a whole sign code would probably be way too long. So how do we solve this problem now? That, that's the question. So as a um, as a seasoned uh, municipal planner, um, you don't touch the sign code unless you have to, because um, even if it seems like a very simple overhaul, um, it tends to be a bottomless pit. So we do, to Deputy Mayor's comment, we absolutely do need to make our sign code consistent with Reed versus Gilbert and some other odds and ends, and that is on the department's work plan to make a substantial amount of progress on that this, this year. Um, and But moving this into that bucket would mean that we probably wouldn't be talking about this again for a year, um, give or take. And if that's the council's wishes, then that's absolutely what we can do. Um, you know, in terms of uh, Chair Dovey's comments on if this is uh, not iconic signs. Uh, I'm not wed to that title. This could be placemaking signs. This could be character signs. I think we could uh, name this um, whatever makes the most sense for the community. Um, Deputy Mayor Honda brings up a good point. Um, and maybe you could clarify this a little bit. As we're redeveloping the mall right now, and by redeveloping, I mean putting all the different things outside on the pads. Is there a way to look at that? And we're talking about downtown, how you could make adjustments, you know, for that area for art deco signs or iconic signs, or because I, if we're going to do this, I, I would think we want to encourage people to have the look. And I'm just, you know, we're, instead of if having one at a restaurant that's coming in very late in the game, versus all the other people that invested, is there a way to kind of put it all together? Um, absolutely, I mean, I think so. What the what the Commons has is um, the sign code allows for basically shopping centers to have like some common monument signs uh, where there are multiple tenants listed on those signs. And then there's individual businesses have sign provisions as well. This will allow 
a, another layer to that to where, you know, if one of those existing pad um, businesses wanna come, want, wants to come in, if they meet the criteria, and we got to maybe um, dial that down a little bit, then they could replace what they have now with something that is that would fit this character building or place making sign package. So that's so so existing businesses could benefit um, as long as they met the criteria for what it would take to get that that sign permitted. They are typically um, and and one of the things. So to just be clear, um, Dix has not submitted for their sign package yet. What the mayor sent around was what they're hoping to get permitted. Um, that uh, the pole sign that they have or that they would want to put in. You know, just to give you an example of scale, um, what they would want to put in is 25 feet tall. What the sign code allows today is 12. So there's there's a significant difference between what that business would like to see and what's currently allowed um, by the sign code. Is the sign um, what they is what Dix wants to do here in Federal Way? What they've done and can't is it the same? They would like the same and our sign code doesn't allow actually either one of those as is the one above the canopy or the whole basically the pole sign neither one would be allowed by our current code so i don't think anyone's going to have a problem finding them i mean they're going to be pretty obvious where they're at um but i am i am concerned about the rest of the development there at the commons and how we're going to handle that with signing i you know there's it, it's more than one business going in there there's a lot going in there and I, I would just think we sh we owe it to the other businesses too to have a discussion about everything that's being done over there. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems to me as though though we should go ahead and 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 move this forward now, and then uh, also ask the ask staff to work on a further revision that can come to us next year, and if uh, and if what we're doing now is tweak some with that further complete revision of the sign code, then then it could be tweaked later on. I'll, I'll make a comment to that. If if you do one and then say we're going to come back later to do the others, I'm not sure that that's equally giving everybody the same opportunity. So if we're going to make it so somebody could go to these like iconic signs different types of signs you almost should do it for that whole piece of parcel at the same time give them the option and then come back and re look at the whole sign code for the whole downtown i mean i i, I actually think that having eclectic signs art deco signs iconic signs in our downtown core might be a tourist attraction you know but if you just do one, it's not the right way to do it. I, you almost need to do it for all or none. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Trudeau. Just a comment um, that the ordinance before you was was crafted in mind with with not just one business. It was many you know, trying to open the door for many businesses or to, to to take advantage of, or at least those that would qualify under the time period. Um, I would also say, as a recovering municipal planner. <laughs> that I totally agree with what Keith said about the the sign ordinance and how um, difficult it is to deal with. And so, if we can take a, a chunk of it now, knowing that we're going to have to do more in the future, that that gives us a head start at least on on the big project that it will be. But can you chunk it with just not one business, but well, that's uh, that's what I'm saying is yeah. what what we have proposed before you is with many businesses in mind. It's not just. One business. It's it's to to Tanya's point is to create a place making vision for the downtown area. Yeah, but what's proposed isn't just for for um, for Dix. It's for downtown. Yes, this is not a single business ordinance. We should take Dix out of our hand out of our head and talk about signs in the general area. So I have another question. So I. You and I have talked about this before, but murals on buildings in downtown or anywhere, uh, even on water towers, which the Lake Haven actually told me last week that they are they are open to that. They're open to having things painted on their water towers, which I haven't heard before from them. So I'm like, 
I like that. But um, <clears throat> our sign code does not allow for murals to be painted on buildings at this point. Is that correct? So a mural is is not a sign unless it's advertising the business, right? I mean, if it if it was a giant um, Smith Brothers dairy, uh, that would be a sign. If it was a bunch of cows standing in a pasture with a red barn in the background, that would not be a sign. That would just be a mural. So so part of and what we found in the, the last city I worked for was because uh, Dairy Gold was in that city and had a, a dairy there. And so they had a big, there's a big mural on Front Street that's cows and stuff, and it has a small Dairy Gold on it. Um, and so if it, you know, so we had to do an interpretation that a certain percentage of the mural uh, could be representing the business um, and then it would be considered not a sign. So if it was below a certain threshold, it could be there, but would then not be actually a, a sign to be permitted. It would just be art. And so I think we would, if we want to explore that a little bit further, um, that's a nuance that our sign code does not have. Um, but that would be something I think we could talk about if we were, say, wanting to um, encourage businesses to have murals on uh, the blank walls of their businesses. That's actually a good thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I would Council just Mark. like to also say that the water tank to the south of the mall, you probably never see it because it's like something you see every day. <laughs> and after a while, you never see it anymore, but it does have a mural on it. It is painted a, a light blue and then has like little waves or clouds or something through it. But it looked better than it did as a gray tank. <laughs> yeah. with, with those clouds in it, it just blended in. So we, <laughs> you can see it there, you know. Yeah. So is there a motion by Chair, anyone? I, I, Chair Doobie. Excuse me. It's me, Tanya. Tanya, oh, over there, the blue sign. Go I ahead. I just wanted to make um, one comment just to follow up on, on uh, Council President Kochmar and also um, Chair Doobie, your comments. Just for consideration, um, Chair Doobie, you had mentioned about tourism and also the, the wording of iconic signs. Um, as it relates to tourism, Iconic signs or historical signs are generally signs that over the decades have become a tourist attraction, if you will, and are actually signs um, that people will travel for many miles or, you know, travel even down from Seattle to um, come take pictures of, you know, great examples are the Hollywood sign in Hollywood or in Richmond, uh, Richmond, Virginia, there's a hill that literally just has a star on it and people, you know, drive from miles around just to take pictures of, uh, you know, that star, which has no significance other than it is just, you know, um, but uh, the other point of the historical significance is, as I mentioned before, that as uh, Council President Kochar mentioned before, there are a lot of businesses that have been in the business community for a very long time that it's part of their identity and their personality, and they actually do command a lot of um, respect in the business community. And when they do come to places like Federal Way, that's a really, um, that's a great beacon of light for other businesses who also are, you know, kind of keeping track of the business uh, environment. And as we come out of the pandemic, also, you know, where the places are that are um, the best places to do business. So it, it's a little bit of a different perspective on the signs and maybe taking more of a perspective on the businesses and also the, the tourism and the amenities and, and the things that it could also bring in the future to the city. Okay, does anybody wanna make yes? I was just want to make a motion. You, okay, you can make a motion. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward approval of the proposed ordinance to the first reading on February 21st, 2023. I second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Now we get to go to the next one, right? Yeah, I'm going to be here for a while. So yeah, you get not... to... <laughs> now you get to go to the fun ones where they give us money, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, good evening, committee members and council members again. Um, still Keith Niven. Uh, uh, this uh, agenda item is an interlocal agreement uh, with Washington Department of Commerce uh, for climate. So the policy question in front of the city council is, should the city enter into an interlocal agreement with Washington Department of Commerce 
to reimburse the city for expenses occurred from writing the climate and resiliency chapter of the comprehensive plan. So this is about recovering city costs and this grant is or this interlocal agreement would uh, repay the city $80,000 for expenses incurred. Uh, the options are authorize the mayor to enter into the interlocal agreement or do not enter into an interlocal agreement. And uh, the mayor's recommendation is one, enter into the interlocal agreement. There is no local match. So this is, I want to say free money. Um, it's kind of like free money. Okay. Any questions or a motion? I move that. Let me find it here. Actually, if you already have it pulled up, you can I make can, the motion. I can do it. Okay. All right. Um, I move approval of the interagency agreement and authorize. Oh, sorry. Wrong line. I move to forward the proposed interagency agreement to the February 21st, 2023 consent agenda for approval. And I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We'll move on to. Item I, interlocal agreement with Washington Commerce periodic comprehensive plan update. Okay, um, so like the last one, um, this is another um, interlocal agreement between the city and Washington Department of Commerce. And this is uh, basically in the, uh, the budget uh, the state budget, the two-year budget, um, the state uh, allocated a bunch of money to help cities update their comprehensive plans. Um, and it's based on population. And so the policy question in front of the city is, should the city enter into an interlocal agreement with Washington Department of Commerce to reimburse the city for expenses incurred from updating the city's comprehensive plan? Um, so this is about recovering city costs. And because we are over 100,000 population, um, we are eligible for $325,000 reimbursement over two years. Uh, so it's in two equal installments. So tonight, uh, what I'm asking for is for your authorization to enter into a contract with Commerce for $162,500. Uh, the options uh, authorize the mayor to enter into the interlocal agreement. Uh, or do not enter into the interlocal agreement, the mayor recommends option one. And again, as with the last agenda item, there is no local match. Uh, this is simply getting money from the state. Okay, is there a question uh, or- I motion? have a motion. Go right ahead. But I'm actually here now. So. <laughs> I move to forward the proposal to the February 21, 2023 consent agenda for approval. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Now we'll move on to uh, what item J? Yeah, interlocal agreement with Washington Commerce Housing and Action Plan implementation. Is this money or is this one scary? No, nope, this is money. So all good three things come in threes. Um, so this is my third. Okay, interlocal agreement, housing action plan implementation. Uh, policy question in front of the city is should the city enter into an interlocal agreement with Washington Department of Commerce to reimburse the city for expenses incurred from implementing the city's housing action plan. Again, we're recovering city costs up to $100,000. There is no local match. Um, options are authorize the mayor to enter into an interlocal agreement or do not enter into an interlocal agreement. The mayor's recommendation is option one to enter into the interlocal agreement. Any questions? I, I guess I do have one question. <laughs> I mean- I was on such a roll. Yeah, you were on such a roll, but we've just approved two of these. We're doing the third one. Is there a requirement of what we have to do to meet some regulation to keep the money? I, so yes. Um, what what each of those contracts do is the city identifies a deliverable. Uh, for example, later this evening, you've got agenda item O, um, which is the housing action plan implementation presentation. Uh, that's gonna be given by the city's consultants, Heartland. Good. And um, that is the deliverable that we are giving to Department of Commerce is their gap analysis and existing condition analysis 
along with uh, code amendments to uh, address the issues that they've identified. So those are the deliverables. So each yeah. one of these has a list of deliverables that we have to execute. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yep. Do I have a motion or any other questions? The motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward the proposed inter agency agreement to the uh, February 21st, 2023 consent agenda for approval. And second. Oh, it's been moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Item K, our favorite uh, target building. Baron. You guys have heard of the target building, huh? Well, that's what it says there. Former target building, demolition demolition bid award. And I think it should have a big target on it. Yeah, you can have some cake. <laughs> Is that part of the bid? You know, we get to... We spend more money in that building. I know, but we have a new building now, right? Hopefully not <laughs> that building. <laughs> All right, let's go to share the screen again. What was that? Okay, my name is uh, Omar Barone. I'm a senior civil engineer with the Public Works Department for the City of Federal Way, and I'm here seeking authorization to award a construction contract for the former Target Building, uh, former Target Building demolition project. We opened bids for this project on January 31st. We received nine um, competitive bids um, to demolish the building. This is a um, a uh, vicinity map of the project. So we have the existing target building is located on the corner of 23rd um, Avenue South and South 316th Street. So the parcel is hi highlighted there in, in yellow. The city, this is a city owned parcel and a parcel that was acquired back in 2014. It's been the subject of continued uh, vandalism and maintenance issues um, actually since before the city acquired it in 2014. So the estimated labor cost to deal with uh, the ongoing maintenance issues was estimated at 60,000 per year. This is a picture of the building from the north side. So this is taken from 314th Street. Um, so what we're, what we're proposing to do is just um, take down the building, completely take, take down the walls, uh, remove the foundation, have all of that hauled off site. Uh, as part of the work, the contractor is going to put up a temporary construction fence just to secure secure the site while the work is being done. And then the foundation will be backfilled. And then we'll basically the area that you see with the foundation and the building footprint now will be topped with um, crushed rock. So that's going to solve a lot, a lot of the maintenance uh, headaches that's, that we've had there. The building's existing building footprint is 105,000 square feet or approximately 2.4 acres. So it's a pretty good size building. This is our project budget. So our available funds are identified there as ARPA funds, 585,000. Our low bid is 373,789 and 50 cents. That's actually lower than the engineer's estimate. Uh, the engineer's estimate that we had put together for this project was 478,000. Um, our um, low bidder is uh, Swafford um, excavating. So they just have low, low overhead and operating costs. So they're able to really um, deliver this work at a, at a nice price for us. The options that are considered before the council tonight are award the former target building demolition to the lowest responsive responsible bidder, Swafford Excavating LLC, in the amount of 373,789 and 50 cents, together with a 15% contingency of 56,068 and 43 cents for a total amount of 429,857 and 93 cents and also authorize the mayor to execute the contract. Option two is reject all bids It direct staff to rebid the project and return to the committee for further action. The mayor recommends option one. Any questions or uh, proposal? I'd yeah, go like ahead. to make a motion. I move to four. Oh, yeah, yeah, question first. Deputy mayor Honda. I didn't look Sorry. that way. I apologize. Uh, uh, when we were talking about this earlier with the ARPA money, I think we had more money in there that we 
proposed? Yeah, so it's proposed that it's budgeted with at, with ARP at 585. So it's, yes, there's some extra money in that. So that money then that we don't spend on this will, we could use for something else. It'll that. roll back into the ARPA pot once this project is complete, yes. And then okay. council have to reallocate it with whatever you want to okay. reallocate it to. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. I move to forward question. option one to the February 21, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Oh, well, they're going to start. Yeah. Uh, but do they have a time frame on on it? I think it's soon. Yeah. So as far as the time frame, so we're looking to uh, get this authorized. It would be a moving to the next council meeting, and then um, so we will award the contract, and then it's going to take approximately about two months to get the different approvals and. You know, as far as the demolition permit um, in hand and approved to be able to start the work, and then we have another two months that we're allowing them to complete the work. So we're looking at just summertime construction and, and right. sure. August completion. Okay, we're now moving to item L, park impact fees, information only. Good evening, Chair Dovey, Council yep. members. Uh, here with a little better update that I had last month Great. for you. And as you know, you uh, city council has tasked the parks department with researching and uh, uh, the implementation of park impact fees to offset uh, growth and development. And so we have gone through a couple scenarios with uh, the consultant, and uh, some of them had out uh, outdated data. And so we've kind of thrown those out, and I can kind of share with you what we've done and kind of the current scenario we're we're honing in on. Um, still more work to be done on it, but. Um, uh, we used the, the council approved updated 2044 growth numbers, and we did have to make some assumptions um, because uh, the park impact fees have to be adopted based on what is adopted by city council. It can't be hypotheticals, anything like that. And so uh, two assumptions we made in the scenario we're looking at right now is that um, there will be two projects that need to be adopted, and um, one would be kind of in the downtown area. Um, adjacent to Town Square Park or an expansion of Town, Share, Town Square Park. And then we do know with the county-wide uh, growth area or the South Station uh, coming in that uh, we are uh, deficient in parkland there. And so looking at a proposed project there. And so using those two assumptions that council in, in the future would appu uh, approve those uh, park projects to be on the capital plan. Um, you know, right now we're looking that the city could could collect for like a single family home in the range of uh, $3,200 um, for park impact fees. Uh, Multi-family homes would be in the $2,600 range for um, round numbers. Mobile homes in that uh, $3,000 um, uh, frame. And then we are, are proposing for it to be both residential and commercial. And so then on the commercial side, based on employees, you could be looking at about $57 uh, per employee. And so uh, it's kind of initial preliminary numbers. Like I say, we're still uh, working with the consultant, uh, working to develop the, the language. And, and those numbers are kind of right now the maximum city council could oppose. City council could choose to, to lower that number. That's just kind of the maximum threshold. And so kind of the schedule moving forward we have is uh, we're hoping that uh, we can take this to the, the April 5th planning commission meeting to, to have a hearing. Um, looking to have final recommendation to this committee uh, in May and then um, for a mid-May uh, first reading of the ordinance and then uh, the first meeting in June for a second reading. Uh, that's all contingent on more work being done and us hitting the deadlines perfect, um, which I can't guarantee right now, but that's what we're shooting for. So, so I have a question. I, I'm the one who brought this up for us to look at. And it would seem to me with downtown park and down by the other transit center, the development's going to be multifamily. It's going to be market rent. It's going to be different. Why would we have a higher number for a new house that's not going to be in the area than a multifamily that it's going to be in the area that's served? To me, those numbers should be reversed. Yeah, and so um, I can't say I'm the expert. I mean, I'm not on... saying you're the expert. I'm just 
giving you my comment. Yeah, understood. And, and I will take that back. And, and um, when we do come into the final presentation, I do want to bring the FCS group in and, and they can uh, explain all the methodology, the reasoning right. behind it. They've explained it to me. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the subject matter expert yeah. on it. They are, and they can articulate it much better than than right. than I ever would. Okay. And so, with that being said, it is fa factored on the criteria and how they are calculated. Sure, Dovey. If I'm, I might attempt to say yeah. what FCS Group would say if they were here. Um, first of all, um, park impact fees uh, generally um, can be applied to any park in the city. So, so the, the, and of course, this is somewhat subject to, um, to what the consultant comes up with, mm -hmm. but just because there's a single family residence, say in the West side of the city that gets permitted, um, we're still able to apply those fees to say, a, or likely able to apply those fees to a development of a park in the city center, because the idea being, regardless of where you are in the city, you, you still could or would use parks throughout the city, just like, you know, um, we might go all the way west to Dash Point. Dash Point's a bad example because it's not a city park. But um, even if you live on the east side of the city, you might still utilize a park far on the west side of the city. And then as to the numbers, um, the reason that I, I suspect that the reason that the single family number is higher than the multifamily number is due to their calculation that there tend to be more people in a single family residence than any specific multifamily unit. And because there are more people on average, say, you know, three people on average in a single family home as opposed to 2.5 in a multifamily unit, um, the amount of the impact from three people utilizing parks is slightly higher than that of 2.5 people using. And, and I would argue the other side that a house that has four people has more than a single, a, a multifamily, let's say, or six, whatever, but the impact is much higher by the multi-dimensional number of how units in a facility on something close to them than somebody that's half away across the other side of the city. Now, I'm, I'm not the expert, I'm just... Yeah. And neither am I, to yeah. be clear. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just wait for we get the presentation and then we can do it. I mean, we need to do something to make sure that our parks are maintained and that we can build more parks and growth is going to require them. Um, I just think we need to structure it the way so it doesn't discourage anybody from building here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's and, what you're doing. I appreciate yeah, it. And like I say, we we have been lacking in funding in parks and, and the, the growth impacts to parks have been felt over the years. And so it would be nice to just be able to collect some monies to help mitigate that. That's why we brought it up. Okay. Any other questions by anybody? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Recycle, recycling lid lift project update. Okay, we're ready. I'm ready to stay out. Well, you know. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, good evening. Uh, my name is Colleen Minion. I'm the Public Education Outreach Supervisor within Public Works. And I'm Reese Hobday, Public Education Outreach Technician in Public Works. And we're here to today to provide you an update on our Recycling Lid Lift Project update. Uh, this project is grant funded by the Washington State Department of Ecology. Uh, we began the project in October of um, 2021, and it will end in May of 2023. And the goal of the project is to increase the quality of recycling within the city of Federal Way while testing out different education materials and incentives to try to change behavior. 
Thus far in the grant, we've monitored the quality of recycling in eight different areas within the city, and each of the areas was made up of 100 houses each. In each of the areas, we conducted the lifting of recycling carts over 10 weeks and provided direct education to the households based on what we saw. We also conducted a pre-sort and a post-sort to evaluate the quality of the recycling and to see if there's any changes. Before the project began, we sent a letter to each household in the targeted areas and informed them of the project, its purpose, and what to expect. We also provided contact information in case they had questions about the project and also if they had any questions about recycling, what couldn't, can and can't be. Um, so we are focused on increasing the quality of recycling because people are still confused about what can and cannot go into the recycling carts. And these are just example pictures of what, um, what we saw. <laughs> um, the very first one, there's um, organic waste in the recycling cart. Uh, the second picture has um, styrofoam, plastic bags, plastic takeout containers. There's also windshield wipers in there that um, are still in the packaging. Um, and then third um, are recycling, uh, recyclables in bags. And we don't want uh, recycling in bags because then it makes it harder to sort at the sorting facility. So we encourage people to just dump it all loose inside of the cart. Uh, after conducting the first pre-sort uh, to gather that baseline data, uh, we really started to inundate the neighborhoods with education and outreach. Uh, we went door to door and we hung magnetic recycling guides on the doorknobs of each household in the targeted areas. And you can see on the screen what it looks like, but this is what it looks like right here. And the guide can be detached by this perforated strip and there's a magnet on the back so that they can put it on the refrigerator to be able to have easy access. Uh, there's also information on there besides what can go in recycling garbage. There's some drop-off information so people know where to take their plastic bags and also household hazardous waste. And also after the pre-sort, we discovered um, that incorrect plastics were a large portion of what people were putting in the recycling carts. And so we designed a postcard that we mailed to every household in the areas and it really highlighted those things that people are confused about. Um, so to provide direct feedback to the household regarding what can and can't be recycled, so this, this is what the lid lift part of it uh, is composed of. So they, there was like a, a brief five to 10 second visual inspection of the cart. There's not digging around, it's just looking at what's on top. And uh, we attached either a good job or an oops tag. <laughs> this is what they look like. Um, and they both have um, like an adhesive strip. And so that's designed to loop around the handle of the recycling cart. And so it's pretty obvious when people go to retrieve their carts on if they received, like which tag they received. <laughs> um, and on the oops tag, uh, we designed it so there was the top contaminants um, listed here. And so staff person would go, do that visual inspection and then just check mark the item. It just made it go a lot faster than rather than handwriting every single thing. Um, and then there is a category of other, you know, for those odd things like windshield wipers, for instance, uh, that we couldn't possibly guess. <laughs> and um, let me think here. Oh, and then there's also a QR code on both of the different tags so that people, if they scanned it, uh, provided more information about um, why things can't be recycled. Because sometimes that's what it takes to get people to stop putting that in the recycling cart. And then we also offered incentives uh, to try to really push the behavior change. So um, residents who earned three good uh, job tags, uh, they had they earned a We Recycle Right yard sign. Looks like this, it's fairly large. Um, and uh, over the first uh, two rounds, we've conducted uh, two rounds thus far, and 137 residents earned uh, their yard sign. And um, also, for in terms of the good job tags, for every good job tag that residents uh, earned, they were entered into 
a drawing to uh, win a free year of service from Ridwell, which is a company that recycles hard to recycle items such as styrofoam or plastic bags. And then also in round one, we provided door-to-door uh, -door education uh, to the households. Uh, the people were given a chance to ask us questions, provide direct feedback about the project. And while there, of course, we're gonna provide additional education. And so we uh, provided uh, reusable produce bags. And while we were handing them out, we were educating them about why it's important not to bag your recyclables. And uh, this is what they look like here. And it's like a mesh bag on the back. So it's designed for produce. I'm here to cover the numbers. So for data collection and tracking, instead of doing it analog and going by and writing it down by hand, we designed with uh, help from GIS staff in City Hall, a GIS-based survey application. So it'll pinpoint your exact coordinates. It'll transfer that into an address that can be used on an electronic map. You'll select which round, which week, so it's easy to look through all the data, and then after conducting the visual inspection, then look through whatever items are there. You select which ones are present or just if it's one item, just one. If there's nothing, you select that there's nothing wrong. And if they got a good job or not, there's also a photo tool so we can take a photo. And later on, if someone has a question, we can really know exactly what they're looking for. Um, as far as round one data results, both groups went up in their total correct recycling by volume. Uh, to note group one, it doesn't look like such a large change. Their pickup was the following pickup directly after 4th of July. And the data showed a lot of items specific to the holiday, fireworks, things like that. And we're not gonna do general outreach on holiday specific items. Um, but they had a 4% increase and group two had a 36% increase overall in total correct recycling. Good job tags by week. They both started at 23 and steadily rose throughout the program with group one ending with 50 tags two weeks in a row and group two ended with 44 tags on their last week. And then we made some small changes based on data. And the first round was kind of to test everything. So we really ramped it up the second round. We went from two groups to six groups. So 200 houses to 600 houses. Um, we replaced door-to-door -door education with a Zoom type virtual open house. It just wasn't feasible for someone to go door-to-door -to, -door to 600 houses, but we gave them the opportunity to come in on Zoom and ask any questions, concerns that they may have. And then we redesigned the OOP tag based on data. We included uh, plastic clamshells, cartons, and a whole section just for other incorrect plastics. That way we could specify those for people. Uh, the round two data results, every single group increased their recycling and the average total increase was 39%. Um, a few outliers, but notably group five went all the way up to 86%. They were the highest. And for good job tags throughout the program for all six groups, they all steadily increased over time. Notably group one started with nine at the beginning and ended with 53. So they really took the information in and made change. And as far as what's next, we're starting round three in late February. So in a couple of weeks here, we designed a new no bagged recycling mailer just because the last two rounds showed us that they were a major problem. So we wanted to have something to address that as well. And we decreased the amount of groups back down to two, but we increased the number of houses per group to 200 so that we could really make an effect in singular areas instead of moving all throughout the city all at once. And we want to note, uh, we want to thank public work employees, Stacy Curry for her GIS assistance, 
Taylor Hedrick and Levi Beckham, who were on the Clear Crew and helped us with collecting and sorting, and Emma Keys, who helped us with sorting and door hanging. Any questions? All right. Uh, so with this, how all of this, uh, how is it financed? Where's the money coming from for, for all of this? So we have a grant with the Department of Ecology that's funding this project, and we send in all of our designs to them, and they get approved by the Department of Ecology so that we know that the money will cover anything that we design or pay for throughout the project. So it's 100% funded by the ecology then? Uh, they pay for 75% and the other 25% we have covered through a King County Solid Waste Education mm -hmm. Grant. All right. And then how is it, uh, I'm, obviously, waste management is who's picking up stuff in the end. I mean, how are things, I mean, what, what's the relationship between what you're doing and waste management and, and how, how, how do the pieces fit together? Sure. Um, we worked with them to help identify the different areas uh, because we wanted to have each area in one day live lifting part of a specific um, truck route. And so we really needed to work with them to find out all the truck routes and to uh, get the uh, mailing addresses because that's that's what we use to mail out all the postcards, for instance. And we also identified where, uh, like when they give us the list of the houses on the route, we were very specific at choosing houses that weren't, you know, number 10 being picked up because otherwise we'd be trying to run in front of the recycling cart, uh, recycling truck chasing us. So we had chose, you know, houses 250, 300, so that we could still, you know, wake up 7, 8 a.m. and uh, start the lid lifting and not have them come down and um, you know, speak to when you call them. Yeah, and then uh, it also helps them identify contamination because we're going out there and checking it. So... For instance, we can give a tag for just one item in the entire cart, and that's just to maximize the amount of education and outreach we can give to people, but they have certain thresholds that are required for them to take action and make contact with someone to let them know about their contamination, and it helps us when I see something out there, we can send a message to them saying, hey, you guys might want to check this house just because they might have a higher level of contamination. Then it brings the education and outreach together from them and us. So we maximize the amount of change that we can make. Okay. And just one more question. The, the yard signs, has anybody actually put up a recycle yard sign? I mean, that's... Um, anyway. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> there are okay. people that are uh, very avid recyclers and they're very proud that they received the three good job tags and we had several people waiting for him to lift lids like looking out their window and like when he attached the tag they were just like you know, you okay. can see him in the window yes and just celebrating. All so right, they were like waiting right. for us. <laughs> Deputy, Mayor. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the report. It's really interesting. Are you going to do this with multifamily um, sites and with businesses too? Uh, we have um, this grant ends, uh, it officially ends June 30th, 2023, and then we'll get a new grant uh, July 1st. Um, and we still need to write that grant, but we are looking at designing a program for multifamily to increase the quality of recycling there. So that's will that's our main, that's our next focus. And businesses? Um, businesses, uh, we do, we have more of a passive education right now, uh, just due to capacity of staff, like to really, uh, make a difference. It's one audience at a time and then seeing what works. And then, um, I mean, we can use some of the similar types of things, uh, the magnetic recycling signs and postcards to be able to go to other audiences as well. Uh, did anyone refuse to participate? Uh, we, uh, Reese talked with one person, uh, one person in person when doing lid lifts that said that he did not know, want, not want to participate. And then I received a phone call um, by someone who was concerned. And then after talking, he said that he did not want to participate in the lid lifting, but wanted to receive all of the education materials. Oh. So it's kind of one and a half. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you yeah, very much. 800, it's a pretty good number. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Okay. We're going to talk about uh, item N, progress updates on sound transit projects in Federal Way. Good evening. Yeah, I thought it was a levy lid lift that you were talking about, but uh, I'm sure you talked to my wife because she scolds me every time I recycle. So I have uh, the artist here uh, from Sound Transit, or working at Sound Transit, who would like to do a presentation. I'm going to have them jump in right away since he's commuting from the East Coast, so he's a little bit, a little bit later than us. Thanks, Kent. I'm going to share my screen. It's in New York. Yeah, so. Okay. So I'm Ashley Long. I'm a project manager for the Sound Transit Art Program. And joining me is Barbara Lukey, director of the Sound Transit Art Program and Sound Transit Government and Community Relations Manager, Katie Droll. Also joining us is artist Donald Lipsky. Thanks so much for having us today. The focus of today's update is to show you the new art concept Donald Lipsky has created for the TOD Plaza at the station. But we wanted to start with a reminder about the artworks and locations we have in development for the Federal Way downtown station. This site plan indicates the approximate locations of the four permanent projects in process as well as the existing artwork at the transit center. At the new garage extension, artist Christine Wynn will have a permanent mural that's over 27 feet high and 225 feet long. The design is inspired by Mount Rainier and the time she spent in the area exploring the beaches and forests. She's been working with the Bonsai Museum and the mural includes natural elements she identified during her time in Federal Way. At the Transit Center currently, there are five installations by artist Clark Wegman. The Transit Center will be demolished later this year and we're considering the options for relocation of the chronologue sculpture. The seed leaves at the end of the Transit Center shelter will be retired from the Sound Transit Art Collection and the light grove will be placed in a reconfigured plaza just north of its current location. In the station area, there'll be three permanent artworks. Catherine Woodgery's dichroic glass spins will span across the platform and arc into the Claire story, creating a cathedral-like effect. Miles Pepper sculpture High Five, which has been deinstalled from the roundabout on 317, will be refurbished and relocated in the landscape area within the Kiss and Ride service slot. Donald Lipsky's artwork will be located in a plaza just south of what's anticipated to be a new residential retail development and is directly across from the station. So that's shown uh, in with the five in this site plan. So Donald is on the call, but unfortunately he has severe laryngitis. <laughs> um, so we were hoping that you would get to hear from him today and uh, for him to speak about his new concept in his own words that he's given me his, his um, presentation. So I'm gonna do my very best to present on his behalf. For many years now, Donald's heart has gone into making public art. Before that, he was creating works for galleries and museums. As shown in this map, he's worked on projects all across the country. Back in 1986, he did a project with COCA that brought him to the area for his first extended stay. He went through the scrapyard at Boeing and made an exhibition out of his findings. During that stay, he was up in Everett and came across a huge pile of steel buoys. He made sculptures with them and they were shown at the Minneap in Minneapolis at the Walker Art Center and later at the Laramar Sculpture, Sculpture Garden in St. Louis and at other places, including the lawn of the White House. To ship these huge objects, he reached out to his colleague, the great Tacoma glass artist, Dale Chabuli, who put him in touch with the enormously resourceful Joanna Sykes, who arranged to ship them by train. Chabuli was the father of the art glass movement that began in the Puget Sound, and it's been known around the world. 
Donald's been thinking about how important glass is to the area. You see it immediately when you fly into SeaTac. And Donald's worked with glass in one way or another for years, and he loves everything about glass. After the Coca exhibition show, he was invited to be an artist in residence at Pilchuck up in Sandwood. Pilchuck was founded by Tripoli, and Donald had a wonderful and productive experience there. And just a few years ago, he was an artist in residence at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. So in federal way, Donald wants to make a truly grand glass sculpture, something that's all about light and color. He's made one major glass sculpture, this butterfly at a university science building in Denver. It's made from test tubes filled with resin. This is his wife, Terry. Much of his work is rooted in some familiar object that is somehow seen differently. This box of chocolates is at the sports arena in Lincoln, Nebraska. And this chair sculpture is at Denver's main library. And how something sings at night is crucial to Donald. This school of fish in San Antonio is where their famed river walk goes under the interstate highway. And at night, it's amazing. People come out every evening to see the fish light up. The sculpture made from canoes on the bridge into Virginia Beach becomes something wonderful at night, as does this sculpture in Kansas City. In federal way, Donald thought about the mountains. He was amazed at how present they are, and he assumed, as do I, that it's the inspiration for the Federal Way logo. And looking at it and thinking about glass, he saw an enormous lamp, like a table lamp right out of your home or office and with a base that could be a bench where people could gather and could feel at home. And underneath, looking up, the glass would be just spectacular. He's given it the colors of the forest, And he pictures it modeled in the way that is so particular to handmade glass and that he finds so beautiful. To emphasize the domesticity of the lamp, he's given it little pool cords. So when you pull into the station, for many of you, it will be coming home. And this sculpture of warm glass, light, and color will welcome you. The shade will be 10 foot on the side and 14 feet corner to corner and about 22 feet high. It's big enough to be a landmark to help with wayfinding. And when the area builds up, it will retain its prominence and be a beautifully scaled to the streetscape. It has a homey domestic scale. It'll be clearly seen from the train and will be a wonderful identifying feature of Federal Way. And at night, <laughs> it will really come to life. It'll be a vision of color and light and warmth. The bench will be about five feet square and the whole base will be made of cast concrete. It'll have this clean modernism of the Performing Arts Center and will quietly complement the spectacular glass shade it will have. It will have some sort of design feature to keep kids from grinding their skateboards, but will otherwise be quite minimal. So in its essence, this is what we and Donald are planning for the Federal Way downtown station. And I'm pleased to share it with you today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them and Donald can type his uh, potential answers into the chat and we can read them. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, one question I have, is there a concern with it being glass? Is there a concern about vandalism? Um, we think a lot about vandalism and durability in the development of working with artists on their designs. And I know Donald thinks about this a lot in his work as well. So we would 
work with Donald um, through the fabrication phase and the design phase to make sure that it's very durable and that um, it would be as vandal proof as possible. And we have a budget for long-term maintenance and cleaning. So if we were to experience any vandalism, we have a collections manager that we work with to make sure any repairs were done. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Lipsky, for being with us tonight. I know it's late in New York City. Um, I, I happen to like this. I think it can be a beacon welcoming people to Federal Way, welcoming people back home if they've left the city to work, although we want people to stay in Federal Way and work and bring people to Federal Way and work. So I, I do like it. Um, I know there is discussion at the Arts Commission meeting about making the bench perhaps bigger than five feet. Is that possible so that more people could enjoy sitting there? Um, we we definitely heard that feedback, and this is at the very early stage of conceptual design. So Donald and his project manager John um, are just starting to work on the design development toward and um, working towards construction drawings. So we'll see if we can make it larger. They they are confined to the engineering of the existing foundation, but um, once they go through that de design development, they'll see if they can increase the scale of the base. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. you being here tonight. Uh, this is Jack Dovey. I actually like it also. I think it's a, a great gathering place idea, but I would uh, echo maybe what uh, Count Steppy Mayor Honda said. Maybe there can be a little bit more seating around the bottom so it's a bigger gathering place than just a place that everybody knows to go to, but I, I like it. I actually have one more question. That's yes. uh, I actually I um, mm -hmm. didn't hear what was being retired. The artwork at the transit center. Can you tell me again what's being retired this year? So the, or when it, when the new station opens? Sure. So at the the existing artwork at the transit center, there um, there's an installation by Clark Wegman that's made up of five different elements. There's the chronolog clock, which is on the canopy um, above the transit center. Mm -hmm. um, there are the seed leaves, which are the two bright red leaves that are on either side of that canopy. And then there is the, um, it's called light grove, the freestanding sculptural elements that are in the hardscape. Um, the seed leaves, the bright red leaves, we're retiring from the collection when the transit center is demolished. We're looking at opportunities to recite the chronolog and the, the light groves, the steel sculptures are going to be reconfigured in a new plaza that's just north of where they are currently located. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Council Member uh, Dawson. Lydia. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I too saw this with um, Deputy Mayor Honda at the um, community center when it was presented. And I just want to say thank you to um, Donald for, for the artwork. It's really beautiful. I do have a question though. One is about the seating. Is it gonna have individual, like how many people can sit around it? And is there like a divider or something that like an indentation or something? And then secondly, what kind of material are, do you plan on using for it? Because it rains a lot and it could get cold for people to sit on it. So what's the plan for that? Thank you. So I'm just going to read Donald wrote in the chat a little earlier that he's pleased to be here and he's been tuned in for a while and he's excited to see government in action. Um, and then he said he's quite open to make the benches a little larger um, and there'll be other benches and seating around the station. Um, but to answer your question, um, one of the uh, comments that we received and that Donald's thinking about in the design is they he wants to design the benches to be comfortable, but also not a place that people could sleep. So that's going to be considered in the design, and it may be, um, it, there may be dividers or something like that um, that will prevent them from being slept on. Um, and right now, he's yeah. planning to use concrete for the bench. Instead of dividers, I wonder if you could have some kind of an indentation that way it doesn't look so tacky either. <laughs> I have. So if there's a way instead of it being flat and straight, then it could be, I don't know, I'm not an artist, but I think there's ways around it, but thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay, I, I don't see any other comments. Uh, oh, no. Oh, oh yeah, excuse me, uh, Council President Kosmar. I, I do appreciate this so much more than the elephant that had been previously discussed. But um, my brain keeps saying, where's the chain to turn the light? No, I'm not suggesting that at all. It's just that my brain is going to the chain. Um, it, actually, uh, I, I think it's a nice idea. We can say, when I was growing up in high school, We'd say, um, you know, meet me downtown under the clock at Marion Franks. And so now we can say, meet me downtown, good way under the lamp. Yeah. It makes me think of the book, The Witch, the Wild, and the Bedroom, or, the, <laughs> you know, the, the lamp out in the middle there. It's, it's a great gathering place. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The Lion, the Witch, it. and the Wardrobe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, well, we appreciate you very much for taking the time and so late and being here and uh, hey, let's get it built and get people enjoying it sooner than later. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thank me. you. Okay, do we go back to the podium now? Is it? Uh, yes. You, want, you got more great news for us? I mean, I've got updates. Well, you know, <laughs> you're supposed to, no, frame it. I got great news, you know. <laughs> Everybody can do an update. You get to be the bearer of good tidings. Okay. This. So I didn't introduce myself before, but yeah, I'm Ken Smith with the Public Works Department, the Sound Transit Liaison for the city. Here for some updates. So real quick for um, Federal Lake Extension north of 317th. Um, still working on landscaping, noise walls, systems duct bank, MSE walls uh, along the whole corridor. Uh, they're doing some OCS drilling and rail deli delivery for a few sections. That should start middle of February, so they're, they're getting close on a couple of spots. And then uh, still continuing on some deck, deck work, basically to support areas not directly over the streets, but kind of adjacent right now. And then grading and prep work for their traction power substations is ongoing. Around the uh, city center, um, they're continuing work on steel uh, for the plaza, um, various sections just to support basically what they built. Uh, construction of the garage is ongoing. They just did a pour uh, for the slab on grade, and they're doing some fire line inspections. Um, I think they're on the second slab on grade pour, so the second section of the deck. Um, temporary widening for South 317th Street is expected this week to support basically the, the construction of the roundabout. Uh, and the shifting of the traffic. And similarly, uh, their signals, their temporary signals are, are finishing up. I think it's within the next few weeks, there was a slight delay, but uh, that should be happening soon. And then the phase closure for 23rd and 317th, uh, they're expecting late February. Uh, and then I think their electrical work will happen around that same time. And then there's some stem walls for the end of line facility have just started to go up. And for the operations and maintenance facility south, um, their FEIS is still expected in May of 2023. However, they um, they gave me that they're uh, a little update that there's going to be a delay based on um, basically NEPA regulations have slightly changed, and so they're they're determining how that will go with NEPA with the federal agency. Um, so they don't have a set timeline yet, but they're they're, they're planning to have updates to um, city council members uh, within the next. I think the next few weeks to kind of give a better idea of that. So there's going to be small sessions uh, and hopefully I can bring that back once they have a firm date. They still expect uh, project completion in 2029. And then similar for TDLE, uh, I don't have much of an update since the last LETC. Um, staff's continuing to work with them on some environmental constraints in the, in the south section. And then I will answer any questions. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. So my art question was answered. Yay. Yes. Um, the meeting question that they brought up way back last summer. Are they not going to have a meeting with the public? They are still uh, working on, on getting that set. The last I spoke, um, the Piala tribe is still reviewing the letter that was sent to them by Sound Transit. So they're waiting for a response from that. And then okay. Get back to me. And then we'll work right. on it. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more and more blue lights, I think you're off the podium, and now we get to talk about uh, housing action plan implementation presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much.
Uh, good evening, committee. Uh, Keith Niven, community development director. As we talked earlier, um, um, one of the things we found when we did our housing action plan was that housing development in the city of Federal Way grew at a much slower pace than the cities surrounding us. And so one of the things that we committed ourselves to do was to look at trying to figure out why that was. Uh, all things being equal, we should grow at the same pace as our neighbors. And um, that is what uh, this evening's presentation is, is setting up. We hired Heartland, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Are you going to start? And yes. Tyson and James. Um, and they're going to, they, they basically did an existing analysis of what's, what's here today, uh, did then a gap analysis, like what's missing, and, and then looked at our codes and our policies and made recommendations, primarily in the city center core, the city center frame, and the BC zones, because those are our densest housing zones that we have in the city. So with that, I actually am walking away. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Good evening. It's great to be here. It's fun to hear about all the other stuff the city has going on. It's a lot. Uh, as Keith mentioned, I'm Doug Larson with Heartland, and then with me is uh, Tyson and James. And uh, you've seen, I think, this presentation already, so hopefully we'll get through it in a reasonably good time and have some room for questions because we're aware of the hour for sure. Uh, quickly about us, we're a local uh, land use economics and real estate advisory firm. Uh, we work with a lot of different organizations, both public and private, and we do advice and implementation and asset management. Uh, this is really in the realm of the civic real estate work that we do for, for ports and cities and other. Okay. So um, what are we doing? Why are we here on the left? Why do we do this work? It's kind of, we excerpted a few comments from the city's own documents, primarily the comp plan, uh, that the area is, you know, currently auto-oriented nature, fairly hostile to pedestrian and, and overall walkability. It's possible, but it's not pleasant. Uh, and it generally lacks an identifiable sense of a downtown or an urban center. At the same time, uh, as we've just been talking about already, uh, you know, light rail is on its way. Uh, that's a significant uh, investment that the city's working to get ready for. And so our job here really was to look at the code as it exists relative to market conditions and try to bring that into something uh, that looks at how it, uh, development might perform economically under the current code and what changes might be suggested to improve those outcomes. A uh, little bit about the study area uh, is highlighted here, three different zones as Keith mentioned. Uh, so we've got the city center uh, core and the city center frame in the purple. And then we have uh, the community business zone that was discussed earlier tonight, uh, kind of extending out along Pack Highway in orange. It's a little bit under 700 acres total. And, um, you know, these are the densest, these are the zones that allow for the densest development in, in, in the city. When we look at the current land use pattern, uh, probably not a surprise to any of you that retail is the predominant use. It's almost half uh, of the acreage in the study area. Um, followed by vacant land, multifamily, and office space. And then the existing multifamily, uh, which is fairly older in stock, as we'll uh, get into in a couple slides from here. Uh, but there's just over 2,000 units in the study area, but not the city as a whole, but the study area, about half of which are senior housing. Um, and 
30, our understanding is uh, just under 40 units that have been created through the inclusionary zoning policy that the city's had in place since 2008. <coughs> now it starts to get a little more interesting here when we look at buildable lands analysis. So what does that mean? Basically means um, make some approximation of a propensity of property to redevelop based on the value of the improvements that are on the property today. So if it's vacant, stands to reason it's got a decent chance of being redeveloped, uh, but we also have included uh, properties where the improvement value, the building value is 25% or less of the total assessed value, which is a fairly common metric to use when employing these kinds of analyses. And using that approach, we come up with uh, about 175 acres or a quarter of the study area that we would classify as redevelopable. Interestingly, the majority of that property is in the BC zone. So, or almost the majority, half, half of the total redevelopable property. Uh, and largely is where most of the vacant land is. And just a quick nod, if you were looking at the previous slide, we have a different number for our uh, vacant property here of 88.7 acres. Uh, it's higher in the previous analysis. We've excluded things like open space, uh, parking lots that are adjacent to an existing development, et cetera. Uh, now I'm gonna touch on the code as it exists currently. Um, so starting with height, uh, reading in the, the, the top row, uh, heights are, you know, minimum 65 feet. They go up as high as 200 feet, depending on the zone we're talking about. Uh, the, there's a construction typology constraint that's really in place here. What we're trying to look at is how do we encourage podium style development, which is one or two levels of concrete with a wood frame on top that's maybe another four or five levels. And so that tends to, I mean, from a fire code perspective, that really tops out at six or seven stories, depending on the jurisdiction. So understanding that, you know, 200 feet is allowed in certain circumstances, 85 feet, uh, that kind of tower level development is, is uh, in our vision down the road from we're trying to make something that's uh, more common in the area pencil in this analysis right now. We talked about, or there was discussion earlier tonight about the, um, the 30 foot height cap, if a community business or a city center frame property is within a hundred feet of single family. Um, as you can imagine, that would cause some challenges for developing properties that are impacted by that regulation. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to hit on here is the bottom row around ground floor uses. So starting with the community business zone, current code requires 60% of the, presumably the facade along the primary street to consist of retail or non-residential uses and 40% of the facade along the other streets. Um, we've not, discerned a clear classification of the street typologies through a map or otherwise just a starting point of, of a challenge uh, but it it also as we'll kind of show later if you do the math on this suggests that there's a retail requirement that's higher than what we see in other projects well, what it's, should it be in your expertise well it's it's a, it's a tough question to answer because it has a lot more to do with where we started from which was a auto-oriented kind of pedestrian unfriendly environment. So if, until you create the infrastructure that lends itself to that sort of walkability, it's hard to make this amenity retail that's not auto-oriented really work in any vein. But the projects that we've seen in other jurisdictions that we're trying to model are more commonly 3,000 square feet total per project. And this comes out to probably something closer to eight or 10,000. So we're at a disadvantage to our competitive competitive cities. Right. Uh, and that becomes exacerbated in the city center core zone where the entire ground floor as it reads has to be dedicated toward residential. Um, on its face, that's challenging obviously because you need back of house, trash, lobby, that kind of stuff. So 
uh, we think uh, and hope that there's you know some room for improvement and a willingness to to look at revisiting those sections of the code. Uh, and then a couple other things to highlight here: the inclusionary zoning requirement uh, does exist in all these zones, and essentially says that uh, any project of scale has to provide 5% of their units as affordable for the life of the project. Do other cities do that or are we the only one? It's or, not common. So we need to get rid of that, correct? If we want to be competitive. That would be an option. I, I mean, mean, there's a number of options. It just it, It's especially challenging for these zones because there's an offsetting benefit of right. additional units, right. but, but it's it, not a density-based code. But in, in your expertise, what we have here is non-competitive to Kent and anybody else around us because they do not have this in their code. Yes, and and okay. and really, it's 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 when we start taking this thing and that thing and trying to add it all up, and you got to have more revenue than you have costs, or you're not going to get anything built. So this is one of those things. Yeah, you got to be blunt with us. Don't go around the bush. Okay. okay. Um, parking requirements are. They're not bad, actually. Um, we're seeing other comparable projects, more like one unit or one stall per unit, excuse me, which is allowed in the code in the city center and frame zones. But the community business zone, if you look at these ratios and apply them to a common project size, it comes out to about 1.6 stalls per unit, which is higher than what I think the market would want to build here. And the goal is from a developer's perspective to um, have the code requirement be less than the market requirement. Uh, they'll always build enough, presumably enough parking for the market. Uh, and then lastly, the you know the ground floor uses and those parking requirements, three stalls per thousand for office is pretty normal. Um, but as you start looking at these food and beverage requirements and entertainment uses, you know, you need one stall per hundred or one per 80 if it's fast food. I think it's presumably something close to that for typical F&B sit down that I think the city wants to see for people who are looking for a sit down meal before or after a show. And those requirements just they get costly trying to put them into a into a stacked flat type of typology. Um, we had good discussion earlier tonight about impact fees. Uh, so this is maybe building off that, although this focus was, was kind of more, I mean, we're looking at the overall stack because of prior, uh, policy around school impact fees. And we recognize that those are currently zero. Uh, they were previously 15,000 per unit and, uh, effectively served as a signal to developers that the city was not interested in seeing multifamily development. You could agree with that or not, but that was a pretty common takeaway that we heard from everyone we spoke with. I think what we would highlight here is, um, you know, the overall scale of where these fees sit a year or two ago, Federal Way was the highest of these comp jurisdictions by a little bit. Now it's the second lowest. Um, the real important thing is trying to institute some predictability to the fee structure. So we've bannered about a couple ideas around, you know, can we set it at something where it's the annual increases are capped to some predictable number or CPI uh, or, or the like over, and maybe it gets reevaluated and reset with match to each capital improvement plan that are, you know, rolling six years. I, I, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. You know, considering what the school impact fees were and, and our total impact fees in the past, do you think that you could say that that was the single largest thing inhibiting growth or, or not? Um, it, was an, it was an early indicator. And uh, I, I guess I'd say what we've heard is that subsequent inquiries by developers of through maybe pre-apps or or more informal conversations didn't uh didn't indicate a uh an open for business mentality for this type, kind of development how, how many years uh stability of of zero would it take to change that perception i mean 
councils and over years can always change, but I mean, do we have like it's going to come up again? And my take is it should be zero as long as I'm on the council. Um, but what kind of stability do people look for? In well, I mean, zero is great, right? At least from a developer's perspective, but that may not be the right number for what the school requirements are. So it's more about the predictability of that fee over a long enough period that you can get through a whole permitting cycle. How, how long is that? Five years, seven well, years, it's, three years? Uh, let's, call it, let's call it three to five years, depending on design, permitting, and construction is, would be my answer. Yeah. Um, all right, well, to tell you more about that, I think we've touched on all these comments. The only other one I would offer is the the multifamily tax exemption is a code policy that is currently in place for the city center and frame zones that allows an abatement of property taxes on all the residential improvements for eight or 12 years, depending on affordability of the project. Um, and it doesn't exist in the community business zone and uh, obviously be very accretive to making development pencil in that zone were to be adopted. Okay, with that, I'll hand it off to James. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna take a chance to talk about uh, the community feedback in terms of the developer community and what they've um, talked about in our interviews. Uh, here's a list of some of the property owners and developers uh, that we talked to. But um, you know, generally the development community has said it's too expensive to develop based on the revenues they can generate. And I know it's super simple and you know Tyson will go into the more complex math and we'll kind of work our way there, but that's the general feedback. It takes too much to build for the revenues that they can generate. Um, and so you know that they've been looking at trying to either uh, increase the revenue bucket or decrease the cost bucket and the community or the school impact fees is one way uh, increasing the revenue bucket it goes to zoning changes increasing um, the size of your buildings or reducing parking requirements uh, and those those elements um, and those are things that were identified by us but additionally identified um, by the developers uh, parking requirements etc um, one of the things also that came up was stormwater requirement uh, and stormwater uh, developers prefer to um, pay a fee versus building your own structures. And additionally, um, what type of stormwater retention is required in different areas um, as well. Um, vaults are required in some areas and vaults are not allowed in other areas, which um, if you want to see podium style development, that is a requirement um, from a developer's point of view of, of having a stormwater vault. Yes. Are these mostly housing developers or are these uh, business? Do they build business? Um, so Parterra is housing. Uh, Grand Peaks is housing. Um, Wolf is housing. Toll Brothers is housing. Um, Schnitzer is is not. Correct. Well, they're a developer, but they're, in this instance, they're a property owner. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, and so kind of we distilled some of these feedbacks into um, kind of four main bullet points of um, the, the, we encourage the city to be realistic, uh, be flexible, um, be moderate and wish list of new products. Some of the feedbacks were, oh, like well, we would develop this site, but the city wants a new road right next to it that we have to pay for as a developer um, and be entrepreneurial, um, i.e., you know, help the entrepreneurs build the development that they want to build um, and take the risk with them. Um, and one of the ways of doing this is using incentives to catalyze development. Um, and these incentives don't have to stay around uh, all the time, but making up that uh, cost bucket, like helping, helping shrink that cost bucket or helping increase the revenue bucket um, over a period of time until rents hit that level that allow for um, more advanced development and to happen without those incentives. Um, one thing we were also asked to look at was the development of condos. Um, that cost structure is typically the same, uh, but additionally, there is a risk of um, 
litigation that has been around in the state of Washington for a while. There have been uh, changes in 2019 that have reduced that um, risk. Uh, but the general feedback we got from developers is somebody who wants to live some play, own a place versus rent, um, wants some sort of amenity, um, their own amenity rich environment. So downtown Seattle, um, you know, Kirkland are areas that are, have been able to have stacked flat condos, uh, a more viable type of smaller living space construction, construction for ownership has been, uh, townhouses, um, has been more popular. Um, Bothell, for example, I, um, spent a lot of time setting the stage for the that's kind of stack flat condo development, but haven't seen that yet um, uh, in the same way that they, they would hope. I have another question, mm -hmm. considering that this is mostly housing developers. Our school district, depending on who you talk to, has a reputation of maybe not being the best in the Pacific Northwest. Did that come up in any discussions about building here and the school district? The reputation of the school district did not come up as a driver for um, okay. residential development. Thank you. Um, so now getting more towards how we can quantify this gap and how we can bridge the gap. Um, so as we talked about uh, previously, the um, the value of a development project is determined by the revenues minus costs by some prevailing cap rate determined by the market. And then the cost of a project is determined by hard costs, soft costs, entrepreneurial profit um, required either, you know, which is usually determined by the investors uh, and then land cost. And what we're going to look at is how this land cost influences the ability of a developer to make a project work. Um, so what, what that number is called, we call a residual land value. Uh, and I'm gonna use a specific case here. So say we have a project that's worth $10 million at the end. So a giant building, tons of apartments, et cetera. Uh, and all the costs associated with it are about to build it uh, besides the land is about $6.1 million. So that leaves us with the land worth, worth $3.9 million, um, 10 minus 6.1. Uh, if that land is about one acre, uh, that means about $90 per square foot of land. On a landowner's case, so a developer looking to build a building, valuing the land, what you could pay, um, they can pay. On a landowner's case, say, you know, the, the, the parking lot is worth about $1.3 million based on the operations of the parking lot. Then that parking lot is worth about, and it's that parking lot's an acre, that parking lot's worth about $30 per square foot. Developer can pay 90 the landowner values you at 30, there's some deal to be made for the construction of the building. Some price will be paid and they'll be able to, to move forward with that. Um, that scenario changes if that land can, you know, uh, is worth more based on the operations of the building or operations of the current structure. And that where land is worth less based off of, the developer can pay less based off a higher cost of construction. So what Tyson's go through next is that we've looked at federal way, we've looked at rents, we've looked at, how buildings, um, current zoning and future zoning, and assign numbers to these things based off what currently exists in the city and have recommendations on how um, those can change. Thank you, James. And uh, thank you, committee, for having us here. I'm Tyson. And uh, yeah, uh, what James is talking about is this, uh, this we built into a model and taking what the developers were saying, we, we tested it ourselves using our own development model to test for this residual land value or willingness to pay for land. To really set the comparison stage, we wanted to understand that kind of baseline or what we call the hurdle value for what land is trading for in the city. Uh, and so we looked at the different zones and we looked at uh, the, the different qualities of the land, whether this is vacant land or whether this land has an existing improvement on it, which uh, would increase the value. Because uh, either way, to have development replace the existing value, we need to know that the, what the hurdle rate is to overcome. And for what we used in this model would be uh, $50 per square foot and then $18 per square foot across the board. Knowing that it, we have to put the disclaimer out there that these values, uh, when you look at the sales comps that we were comparing against, uh, value dramatic uh, change dramatically. 
Um, so this is just a rough indicator to kind of measure against the values our model ca calculated. Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. I mean, when you had the cost on that last slide, you got BC zoning and you're, you got the adjusted uh, cost per square foot, right? Mm -hmm. that, I mean, do you, you know what it costs between office land BC? I mean, the difference between those two zones, you probably didn't look at that, but. No, but if for existing office, the value will be much higher, for example, than the raw land. I guess if it was raw land and it was zoned BC or owned OP, was it? Is there a difference? Yeah, there'd be a much higher willingness to pay for BC zone land because you can do more with it. And, and it's that underlying use that you can, will drive that revenue. Okay, thank you. Um, That's what I thought. Absolutely. And and in this case, our, the, the the assumption is that uh, to, to drive that podium style development, it's going to be the residential component. So the really big, the big thing we want to test in this model are, yes, the costs, uh, but also the revenue assumptions, just because that um, those assumptions uh, value dramatically, it, the, the, they're very sensitive to these inputs. So we first took a look at what existing rents uh, in federal way are achieving for existing projects. And as you can see, a lot of the product that uh, is currently existing is older and is achieving rents uh, averaging about $2.08 uh, per square foot. Um, this isn't necessarily indicative of the type of product we, we, we think the city wants to see in the downtown core. So we had to look further afield uh, to find the type of product that we're, we're modeling here. Um, and so looking in surrounding jurisdictions where we've seen newer product that is this kind of six story, seven story podium style development. Uh, the proto, these are the rents are 35% higher than the, the current rents in the city. And um, one thing to note, so this informed what we used as our base rent assumption. So using the average of $2.84 um, as the base rent. One interesting note here is that all of these projects, except with the exception of one, uh, participate in that MFTE program, which is the multifamily tax exemption program that the city already does have in some of its zones. Um, uh, one more question for you. These ones you just showed, mm -hmm. none of these have requirements to set aside for low income facilities or, I mean, what's the word I want? Uh, the inclusionary. They, the, yeah, they're not being mandated to give three apartments to somebody at a lower cost than what the market value is. That is correct. The, the, the only benefit will come through the, uh, potentially through the MFTE program. But yeah, if they really. elect to be in it. Correct. Okay. One thing that is important to see, just because the model is very sensitive to the rent assumptions, that income, how much can that property generate? Um, we wanted to test, uh, we, we use the prototype rents from those similar projects to inform that rent number, but what about uh, rent increases from transit, per, let's say? So one thing that we tested was to see, well, what to achieve that hurdle value and, and surpass that hurdle value, what rents would need to be achieved in each of these zones. And we looked from the BC rents would need to increase 15 to 20%. And in the, the city center zones, you're looking at 30 to 40% increases to rent. Uh, when historically over the last 10 years, the city has seen maybe 5.6% annual rent growth. Um, and we've did some uh, background research on what what rent bump could be attributed specifically to a transit a light rail station, for example, and the studies are pointing to an increase of five to 10%. None of this is able to get you over that hurdle value alone, um, which was an important thing to test. So we held our base rent assumption at that $2.84. For costs, uh, General, construction costs really don't vary much across the region, but a big thing that does is the different costs associated with each of these jurisdictions to develop in them. So what we modeled here for each of the zones, and we'll compare them at the end here as well, but um, was what the current code is and what that current willingness to pay for land is, uh, which is this base scenario with really changing nothing. With the only thing we would be using would be that uh, the prototype rent from the product that we see in the surrounding neighborhoods. And then we, we tested some code adjustments. So for example, in this BC zone, we, we did incorporate the MFTE benefit. We removed that inclusionary affordability requirement. We reduced the parking ratio and the, um, the retail uh, requirements as well. And then we assumed an offsite stormwater treatment availability. And all those uh, changes in com combination produced a, a land value 
um, that was a residual land value that was much higher than the hurdle rate, uh, which would say that that would help catalyze development in this zone. Um, we went through and did this for this, uh, the city center frame and the city center core zones as well, which we removed that inclusionary affordability. Uh, the MFTE program was already in the base case scenario. Uh, because it's already allowed there. We did reduce the parking requirement and uh, significantly reduced the retail space requirement. Um, and then also assumed that offsite stormwater treatment and in the same assumption for the going above the base case scenario, the code adjustments um, produced a land value that was higher than the what we determined were the hurdle values. It's the same in the CC uh, city center core zones. And now just really comparing against these, the big thing here that we took away is that um, these changes had a substantial impact on the, uh, the likelihood that these properties could be redeveloped above, above both the vacant and improved land hurdles. Um, the, uh, some of the changes have a greater impact, and that's something that we'll show on the next slide, but uh, there is a, the, the big one that was the takeaway from especially the city center core zone was that the retail, the, the requirement for the retail is a significant impact. Other impacts like the inclusionary housing do, do have a significant impact as well, um, but the, by far the biggest was the retail requirement on the ground floor. Um, so really to compare this, what we did, and this is just a quick to, quick to compare and then I'll turn it over to questions, but well, what was the size of the impacts for some of these? I know some of the questions, you, you've asked a couple of questions about the inclusionary requirement. So this assumes in the full adjustment scenario where all the changes were that we recommended or we tested for were made at, at, at once. And in each of these, we made one modification to each of the, uh, the different um, elements to be tested to see the impact. And as you can see there, the ground floor retail reduction. So removing that, that um, had the, the most significant impact there, meaning that um, that contributed the most to this additional land value. And I'm going to, with that, I'll turn that over to some questions. I know it's a pretty intense analysis, but um, hopefully that provides some clarity. Can we get a copy, <clears throat> excuse me, can we get a copy of this so we have it's, it to look at? It's in our packet, I think. I didn't see it in the packet. Oh, in the packet. oh part of it was, okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So, so do you can you estimate? I know if we had made these changes five years ago, or or what? When did we? When did the other cities? When did the curve go like this? How far back? Do you get? Could, did you test for that? Like, you know, we've had high school impact fees. We've had this inclusionary housing. We have retail on the bottom, and we have parking. All four disadvantages is what you just said. What's that? Stormwater. And, and stormwater vaults, yeah. So if we go back, how far back ago did we do what we thought we were doing and get off kilter? Can you, is there a path where yeah. we got out of sync? I don't, we're not sure when those uh, current code was codified, but I mean, there was a but, giant development wave that just happened. And, and we started. missed it all. Yeah. Um, and if we made these changes now, you have a feel for how much gas is still in the tank? Um, well, it's, you know, ever people need a place to live. Right. Always. And it's all about the land, right? need a place to go to work anymore. So, um, depending, but it's hard to say exactly it's it's you're setting the table yeah. and saying we're open for business we've taken a hard look at a few things and made some code adjustments that we think will better condition the city to development mm -hmm. and then you know there's a, how you want to promote that from an economic development perspective is a potential implementation measure but you can't make someone do something. Right? No, I understand it. Somebody's got to invest the money and want to be here. We just have to set the table so they feel like we're in the game. Keith, how long would it take us to 
if we decided that these were things we wanted to change? What's the timeline? How fast could we move? <laughs> you, you've already like started the fast lane with the view protection code amendment yeah, um, but, I mean, at, at the council in, retreat. Should we be done in 90 so days? This is, days? Um, so here's the thing. Um, I've already drafted code amendments. Um, and the one that's causing us pause to move forward uh, is the school district. I'd like to talk to the school district about they don't talk, there's a there's they a, don't talk to us. Why there, do we want there's to talk a to them? there's a couple choices. Um, one is, you know, what they said was and, and the key is predictability. You know, the idea that we go from zero to possibly back to 20,000 a door or even to 15,000 a door. If you're a developer and you have to perform a, an unknown like that, you just you assume the worst case scenario, right? Sure. And so there's two choices. There are um, some uh, school districts that have uh, in the state that have adopted a cap that said, okay, in no in no circumstances will the school impact be go above X thousand um, dollars. There's another scenario that we've talked about, which would be you allow it to increase by a maximum of say like $2,000 a year. So if I know it's gonna take me three years to get through the permitting structure, I can then, whether it's a cap or a certain amount per year, I can make an assumption of what's the worst case scenario that I need to account for for this for the school impact fee. So there's there's a couple of choices. I would love for this to talk about that with the school district and potentially get some thoughts before we put yeah. something out there but, for the planning commission. But my, but my question yeah. is, I understand single family homes. Many of those will have school school age children. Right. Most market rent facilities, if you go look around them and you do the studies, I believe, don't have a lot of children. And most of them are empty nesters who want to stay in the neighborhood, who want to move somewhere nice and stay, or they're young professionals, maybe single or getting married. I'm profiling. Sorry if I'm doing this, but um, that don't have a lot of children. So, I mean, is there a study on that somewhere? I, I, my gut tells me that most of these places aren't rich with lots of school buses coming and picking up children to go to school. Um, the stuff that's going to happen in the city center core, city center frame in the BC zones, um, at least, you know, if, if, if the proposals we got back for TC3 is an example, um, a majority of those units are going to be studios and one bedrooms, okay. um, which really don't so, generate so, a ton of kids. So we could give predictability to the areas we want to redevelop sooner than later and it doesn't really have much to do with schools, right? I mean, potentially. I mean, you could have two tiers. You could have the city core development area where there's studios and not children friendly, and then also maybe have something different in the other areas. Could that's, you a have choice, two that's a choice as well. Um, but to answer your question, my hope would be that we would get these code amendments uh, back to you guys by mid-year mid-year so no later than june that's my hope okay or Is there, okay uh, deputy mayor honda your turn i'm sorry thank I'm, you uh so you've talked about an <clears throat> impact <clears throat> excuse me impact fees and yet tonight we talked about having a new impact fee mm -hmm. so how would that impact <laughs> what we're talking about for development uh, uh, well it's a you know it's it would be a new cost mm -hmm. obviously um, and then the question would be, well, that what's the nexus of that cost? So I don't even know if this is possible, but, uh, there was discussion around the impact fees and how those, you know, anyone can use any park. And I, be, I'm not, I believe the impact fees then can also be used for any park requirements citywide. Um, developers, you know, would, would probably be more interested in contributing funds toward park improvement and open space requirements, they'd be more enthusiastic about it if they knew that the open space that was going to be improved or acquired was actually going to help their project. Because it then it's really an amenity. So then um, with the condo discussion, I know at the state legislature, there's been discussion about changing some of the, the rules with condos. Mm-hmm. 
will that help us get any condos built here or are we still having a cost issue with uh building them and and someone purchasing them uh, we we see it as more of a question of kind of when not if if you execute well on setting the stage for development the initial projects are they're going to be for rent and you know they're going to you're talking about a one bedroom unit that rents for 2100 bucks i mean they're not cheap uh by and large but just the mentality of someone committing to a mortgage is kind of predicated on the area being proven and established so we think success in the try before you buy element if you will through renting will predicate ownership over time but it's not trying to encourage it immediately is unlikely to yield results and one more uh it's just a statement um you know with the cost of housing going up the cost of everything going up i think we will be seeing more families in rental units downtown and that we may need uh to build more schools eventually here in federal way so i you know things are expensive and families if they can't find a single family home that they could afford or that they a location that they want you know we may see more families downtown than we're expecting mm -hmm. so just a statement it's certainly possible it's just i think the comment was more axiomatically usually if you have a smaller unit size you're going to have less people that live in the unit and so is one of them an adult one of them a kid sure you know but you're it's less likely with the kind of product that the market underwrites if you will that you're going to see four or five uh household family household families members yeah councilmember walsh and then i i think oh, that you go down to <laughs> well I'm, I'm just amazed that we haven't done this before that it's taken us this long <laughs> to get here i mean i i have been hearing commercial at the base or retail at the base for so many years thinking that was a good thing and now we're hearing it's not so i, I mean i really appreciate that um do you think that this is going to be a catalyst for belmar mobile home park on the other side of the commons mall to redevelop i'm not familiar with that property and its zoning so i would need to um so uh I guess I would answer one of the things that I believe that the council committee this council committee is planning to do uh, and we'll talk about it next month I believe is initiate a kind of a zoning study for 324 to 336 from PAC to I-5 um as we go through that uh we'll be looking at zoning as one of the things and if ultimately there's a different zone that we want there, understanding some of the ingredients for the zones, whether it's BC or something else, is going to be helpful for um, all of that area and anything else we kind of add new zoning to over the years. So I would yeah. say yes. Thank you. And the other thing is I'm not too concerned about it being uh, rental versus condo. We all want condos because eventually those rentals can become condos, that conversion. And so I see that as a future. So, but thank you. You've given us a lot of really great information. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Hey, well, with, with school impact fees, uh, yeah. I mean, the, uh, am I not correct that the school can propose what they want the impact fees are, but isn't it ultimately the city that, that, uh, yes, generally that is true. Mm -hmm. The so, city makes the ultimate decision. Yeah. Yeah. And and so we could put a cap on them whether the school wanted that cap or not. Correct. And indeed, many other jurisdictions around us have done so. Okay. All right. So, so we could really dictate predictability. Any other questions? Yes, Councilmember Honda. So when, thank you. When we we're talking about school impact fees, um, it would be great to to have to be able to tell a developer, yes, in three or four years it's going to be this. But councils change. I know we we, so we, we have a two year window. Yeah. So 
just saying i mean we know, have a, we actually have a one year window to get this done just just saying it i and and developers know that you know they they know that things can change on the council but we but, can give but, some but then they can change in the other cities too thing i think we need to be cognizant of the fact that this is also going to impact the fire department fire impact you they do collect a lot of taxes already okay, okay. anything else on uh information on this one before we go to their next one before 8 15. <laughs> <laughs> no this one this one would be done hey this has really been very helpful and very good. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to move to information on the public garden wildlife. Yeah, so um, this, is, uh, this is really just an opportunity for uh, representatives of the property owners to come and talk to this, the council committee um, Wild Waves is covered by, a, um, as we mentioned earlier, a concomitant agreement um, or a development agreement, which basically limits the land uses and, and other things that happen on the property. And uh, what the property owners would like to do is, is to chat with the city about maybe making some amendments to that contract. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ann, who is uh, attorney for the property owner. Thank you, Keith. Chair Dovey, members of the committee and council members. My name is Ann Giggy. I'm an attorney with Hillis Clark, Martin and Peterson. And we've had the pleasure of working with the landowner of Wild Waves um, on land use matters since they annexed into the city back in the 1990s. And so that's, that's been a long-term relationship that we've had with them and that they've had with the city. Um, Thank you for allowing us on your agenda tonight. I understand we are the last item on a long agenda, so I'm gonna keep my comments brief, um, but we're happy to answer questions. And I do have one of our consultants with us tonight who has looked at some traffic considerations for the, the park area. So we have him available if there are any questions about that. Um, what, we are, what the landowner would like to do Yes, there's basically two things in the concomitant that he is trying to change. The first one is to make it easier for the park operator to make some pretty significant investments in the park. The operator is is interested in investing up to you know 20 some million dollars in the park in new rides and replacement rides. But in order to do that, he needs to have enough runway, enough time to recoup the investment on those rides. And so Right now on the 20 year agreement, there's about 15 years left. What we're asking for the amendment is to extend the term of the agreement to a 30 year term, which would make it easier for the, the park operator to find investors, find financing, to be able to move forward with those kind of significant investments in the park. So that's, that's thing one. And then the second thing that the landowner would like to do is um, after the park had to close down for a year during the pandemic, it was a little bit of a, a, a light bulb going on that you need to think about the future in, in different ways. And what he was looking at is that the, the uses that were allowed there, there's a couple of uses that are of interest that are not very well put together in the agreement as it is. So for instance, for the hotel use that is an allowed use on the property in the future, um, it's limited to a five acre lot. And on a 65 acre property, a five acre lot for what's gonna be the showpiece hotel is not a really very realistic thing. So we'd like to remove that five acre limitation on a ho future hotel use. The, the second one that is a, is a very strong use in the current economy, of course, is warehousing. Warehousing isn't allowed use on the site, but it is limited to an accessory use of 25% of the site. So again, what, what he is looking to would be to remove those restrictions from those two uses. There's no development proposal for either of those. Um, the, the owner wholeheartedly supports the park going forward. And as I said, would like to extend the term to make it easier for the park to make investments in the property. But what he is looking to is that if there were a situation in the future, another pandemic that the park couldn't recover from, a terrible earthquake, those kind of things, to make it easier to pivot to a different land use on the site if that became necessary in the future. 
And those are things that, you know, like I said, there's no development proposal with this, but, but what this would do would make it easier to talk to other market segments in the future if that, if that became necessary. And, and turning that back to some things that this committee has talked about tonight, what you're talking about is how many years would the property have to sit vacant and idle if the park use were to go away. And so that's what, what you're trying to guard against is to minimize that in the future. So that's the request. It's fairly simple. What we're hoping is if it's the pleasure of the committee, we look forward to working with staff to put together, uh, process the application that has been made. And like I said, happy to answer any questions. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Can you define what an accessory use for warehousing is? So I'm thinking of warehouses like IRG is building where trucks come and go and cause, uh, you know, we don't get a lot of uh, financial gain from that as a city. And we have a lot of issues with roads and, and con congestion on roads, I will assume, when once that opens over at the old warehouse or property. So what is an accessory, accessory use for warehousing? What's the definition? Well, the, the definition is it's in the concomitant and it is just, it's, it's actually not defined. It just says that warehousing is allowed as, as an accessory use up to 25% of the principal use. And so you're, you're asking for an example of what might a use be that would have a 25% accessory use. I'm not asking what kind of warehousing this is. Is it like we what we're going to see at the IRG property? Big concrete structures with truck bays coming and going is that what <clears throat> is that what this is i would i would go i would say that what we're looking for is that for the use to be allowed we're not proposing any particular structure like i said there's no there's no development proposal associated with this um, but warehousing slash dis distribution is a use type that is the use that is being asked to be made more flexible at this site no current proposal for that to occur yes. Can so, I jump in for just sure. a second and ask a question? The, the main request, as I think I heard you say, is not warehousing, but the ability to go from 15 or 20 years on the park to extend it longer so the, the park people can invest in the, in the land so they can be here long term. Well, is yes, that, that is that's true. the main, yes. you're, you're the, correct. The, the main ask, if staff works on it, is to give wild waves whoever that is that owns the rides the ability <clears throat> to have to know that if they invest 20 million 10 million 5 million 30 million they got a long runway to get it back That's, that, that is correct and the second request is we already have something in there that says you can do a hotel or you can do some warehousing as a fallback if wild waves all of a sudden disappears and there's a pandemic for three years and nobody ever goes to a park again. Correct. Is that what you're asking to work with the staff to talk about? Correct. Okay. I'm, I'm just asking for the- Yeah, no, I just, I just so, wanted to, because yeah. it's not, I don't think right. we're asking for warehousing like IFG or anything. Well, that's what I'm trying to, yeah, that's why I was, to find out. Yeah, yeah. That, okay, go ahead. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Council Mayor Walsh. Yeah, and... I mean, to to me, the the extension, uh, you know, un unless somebody has some reason not to, I, it seems to me as though that's a no brainer, you know, and and also the expanding the the portion that could be a hotel from five acres to a larger, it it seems like that makes perfect sense as well. Uh, I mean, I I do have some concerns with the with the warehouse part. And if, if, uh, you know, if, you know, if the earthquake happens or whatever, and I mean, hey, and, and wild waves is no more, is warehouses what we would really want there? Or is there better use of the property than that? And I think that that's where the, where the, the, the sticking point could be. On, on the other things, I, I don't see any problem with it at all. And I, I suspect that the rest of the council doesn't see a problem with it either. Uh, but it's just the, the the warehouse part, whether that's the would be the best use of the of the property for the and make the most sense for the city. And uh, you know, I mean I have 
concerns also with, I mean, if we say, hey, where housing is allowed, that kind of opens the door really wide to a lot of different different possibilities. But just just my thoughts. Councilmember. Uh, all I can say is that if we have an earthquake, we're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see what we could do to help Wild Ways and Chenna Parks to redevelop to their highest and best use. There, we have we have such a lack of corporate investment in our community, a lack of places where our children can get jobs, a lack of um, excitement. I would love to see what we can do to help. Thanks. Yes, uh, Debbie Mirhana. To an uh to increase this agreement with wild waves do we need to go out and talk to the homeowners around there was there anything in that agreement with the homeowners that they need to be pulled into this i don't believe that there's anything in the concomitant agreement that necessarily requires to outreach to the homeowners the property owner has done that pretty regularly over the years whenever there's been a proposal and with the request for an amendment to the development agreement, there is a requirement for a public hearing. So if we move this forward to city council, there would be a public hearing. All correct. Okay. So the homeowners would have their ability to, to give us their opinion about this. Correct. Thank you. Councilmember Walsh, I see you. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, once again, with the, with the warehousing park, Obviously, the 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 property owner is. I mean, he is a key. Uh, he he is a great asset to the community, and and I think that that all of us recognize that, and that that he's a um, uh, you know he, he he's he's helped the community tremendously, and but you know I'm I'm just wondering if if you know if if he could rethink and and rather than just warehouse other possibilities that would achieve that objective for him but from a different you know a different angle perhaps so, so this is informational only but can we keith can you kind of work through this and get back to us on work with the landowners attorneys and everybody and kind of craft something and come back to us so we can look at it is that okay with everybody okay. um I, I guess i should mention this at this point um given given what the chair just said so um any applicant can request a development agreement amendment um which is what has been requested here but under our code it um the negotiation of that development agreement or development agreement amendment needs to be initiated by either council or council committee okay. so there has to be some form of formal initiation in order to negotiate such an agreement by council committee and or council so, so can the if i ask the committee to make a motion since it's and move this from information to action to request to take step can i do that or do i have to wait 30 days doesn't it have to be on the agenda for action yeah, I, I think it needs to be on the agenda for action. So if if that was the intent, that would be a placement on the next LUTC okay. agenda item and then a and then a decision at that point. Okay. Well, we can't we can't take action on it now. We had it for information. And I would request that we put it on the agenda for March to take action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we've gone uh the longest land use meeting I know of in history. Is there any other agenda items anybody would like to discuss? I, I would just like to ask one question. Just I, I, I've been out of town and I read online about this Redondo Heights development uh, that uh, the MSC is doing. And, and I kind of thought, what? I, I haven't heard anything about this. And could That's we have some light shed there? <laughs> um, general light, uh, not not a not a not a strong beam here. So um it's uh basically um shelter uh resources is building um what's kind of like silver shadows phase two so where silver shadows is up on pack highway north pack highway just south of the park and ride lot um there is vacant land to the east of that 
um, and they are building an affordable housing project and a food bank. Um, and they are about ready to uh, do a groundbreaking. They've, they've already them. broken ground, right? It's right by all city fence. Yeah, last Wednesday. I missed it. You did. You missed it. It was at 2.30. <laughs> Awkward. Um, so apparently they just did a groundbreaking. So. It, was, it was right before the stadium. It was a big hole. <laughs> nice. Um, so yes, so new affordable housing project under starting construction. Um, and uh, yeah, did you have any questions? Yeah, I mean, just I, I, I think it kind of went under the radar as far as as I go anyway. I think so. hasn't it been on the dockets for a long time? We approved it. So we approved, but we approved, we approved it like project. Yeah, not this year, but two years yeah, ago. Yeah. Oh, you weren't here, maybe. We weren't on the okay. council when oh, that sorry. was happening. It, it predates right. me. It predates me too. The okay. the genesis yeah. right. of this. It's, it's okay. about three hundred units for okay. um, affordable housing through the Multi Service Center. Workforce housing. And okay, it, workforce housing or affordable housing? I mean, because there's a, a difference thing. there, right? No, it's about no, the same thing. No. Yeah. Right. And then it's going to have a food I, bank. With I it. did get one note about it a long time ago that they were very happy that the school impact fees were taken off. They benefited, I think. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. Um, we will adjourn. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you. My name is Good night. Good night. Oh, boy.